Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the another new session of Meta and Meta, a webinar initiative by Meta and Meta Knowledge Sharing Session. And today our topic is appointment of managerial personnel and their remuneration. And the presenter is our own Maliha Seth, and our panelist, of course, as usual, our Mr. Bala and Sudhakar is there. And of course, today we have invited our old friend Amita Deshai. Welcome, Amita. Thanks for your time. I was trying you since long. Now, at last, you are here. Uh, to formally introduce, Amita Desai is a practicing company secretary with 27 plus years experience in the field of corporate compliance and governance. She is also an insolvency professional and CSR consultant. She is founder of Amita Desai and Company, firm based at Mumbai, which provide advisory and secretary service on Companies Act, FEMA, Security Law, IBC, Mojo, Acquisition, Restructuring, and CSR. She is also advising on governance compliance to many NGOs. She is a regular speaker at various forums of ICSI, ICA, and other social enterprises. She has contributed various articles which are published in Chapter Secretary Focus Magazine of WRC Mumbai Magazine of Mysore Chapter. She is a trainer, motivator, and a way reader. She loves traveling and interacting with people on issues related to governance. Welcome, Amita. Welcome, all panelists, to today's session of appointment of managerial personnel and their remuneration. Amita, I request you to share your thought on the topic for one minute, and then Sudhakar, and then Mr. Bala for one minute, and then Malia, you can start. Over to Amita. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dipti, and thank you, Mehta and Mehta, to inviting me on having me here. It's a great pleasure to discuss with everyone, and Sudhakar Suji's present is also motivating. He is expert on the subject. Nevertheless, I think the topic is very simple, but still there is a lot of confusion around our fraternity and people around uh, with respect to public limited company and uh, listed entity, how much we can give. And there are typical circumstances when people get confused whether it could be uh, approved or it, it should it requires somebody's whose approval audit committee or nrc that's a dilemma many a time but i think after the, listening to the presentation of malia and uh, today's webinar we will try webinar we will try to attend all the question on the chat box whatever we get we'll try to attempt maximum and over to sudhakar ji thank you yeah thank you amita and good morning to everyone uh, in fact, you know, whatever Deepthi has introduced in Amita, only one word I want to add, she is an iconic professional. And uh, virtually, she put her uh, hand everywhere and anywhere, and she come out of that in flying colors. So I, whenever I take some names in my CLDP sessions and all, and one of such names is Amita from Mumbai. And uh, thanks very much, Amita, for uh, I mean joining us today in this particular webinar. On such an app topic, you know, the appointment of managerial personnel and the remuneration, in fact, in the good olden days, when I entered the profession, that point of time, one of the strength of the profession uh, as a company secretary is to get the managerial remuneration approved. And uh, whenever you appear for an interview, the first and foremost question they have to put in those days, like the RPT these days, is about managerial remuneration only. But in those days, it was very tough because for even the smallest of the smallest amount, you have to go to the central government. Nowadays, fortunately, you don't need to go to central government at all except one or two issues uh, as far as managerial remuneration is concerned. And uh, definitely uh, one uh, request to uh, Amitai, since I'm not going to be there throughout because I have another conference to attend today. My request to you is to please bring the, uh, what's called as the niceties between the manager and managing director. People think that manager is inferior to managing director, which is not so. In fact, manager is much more powerful person than of a managing director. Because manager inherently he is having the powers under the act itself. He has the overall powers of the to run the company. Whereas as far as the managing director is concerned, he is to be assigned with, he is to be delegated those powers. Then only he can do that. Okay. And similarly, you can have more than one managing director, which is not possible in case of a manager. So manager position is much superior to the managing director, which unfortunately, I mean, with all due regards, very few people know about that. That particular uh, uh, difference you know, is to be brought in. And at the same point of time, you may also say that because the people doesn't understand the importance of manager, that's why very few companies are still having the position of manager. But managing director is always a, what's called as a, a glamorous position than of a manager. 
though it is other way around as far as the powers are concerned. Apart from that thing, you know, okay, that uh, in fact, in the listing regulations also, we know that very well that uh, the appointment of a director has been cut down earlier. Once you appoint an additional director, it could have been done up to one year. Now it has been cut down to three months. Okay, the same thing is applicable to even to managerial, managerial person also. That also you may discuss about that particular important thing. And the third thing, what I would like to mention is that once shareholders reject the appointment of a managerial person earlier, the managements used to bring them through the back door, which is not possible now because after that amendment of the listing regulations, I think if I'm not wrong, 21 amendment, if a managing director has been rejected by the shareholders, they can be appointed only by the shareholders, but not by the board of directors. So these are the three important points, according to me, which I thought I will bring it. And now, Bala, sir, it is up to after I'm handing over the baton to you. And after that, Maliha can start her presentation after that. Thank you very much. And have a good time and have a good discussion also. Thanks, Sudhakar. Thanks, Sudhakar. Good morning to all of you. I have a great pleasure in welcoming you to this important topic of today concerning the managerial personnel and their remunerations. Because today we are in the era of the ease of doing the business. As Sudhakar actually said some time back, the one of the strength of the company security in those days was can you get the manager, managerial personnel approvals there? I have seen even for 10,000 rupees amount, you know, to go to the government and it takes long and long time to get the approval. And leave alone that, if you want to appoint the ex 48 person, get a lot of marathon job to get the things. And one more reality which I have faced in those days, actually, we brought a person ex -partiate. You know that in case of the inadequacy of the profits or loss making situation, the minimum remuneration which is to be paid, that is the condition even today that exists. Luckily, today there is no government approved record. It can be approved by the members. Those days, we'll have to go to necessarily to the government only. So what we used to do to safeguard the things, because we have agreed with the ex personnel, we used to write, in case of the inadequacy of the profit or loss-making situation, the same remuneration which is paid to him will be treated as a minimum remuneration. That used to be the class. But in spite of that, after the year is over, we'll have to actually give the details, etc. We'll have to go to the government, get the approval. By the time we get the approval, it is eight, nine months. In some of the cases, the expert term is gets over, he actually gets departed from this country also. The money actually is already paid without the government approval. So these are the conditions were there. Probably they wanted to bring all those things. And in the ease of doing the thing, a lot of relaxation, a lot of doing away with the government approval. But still, regulation is the regulation. What is the right thing is to be done, right thing is to be done. Amita also would agree today. There are two regulations there. One is the company act, one is the listing agreement. Although both are to be adhered, still there are organization issues are there between these two actually. In fact, when Sudhagar said this, this additional director, when he's actually appointed, that he has to be regular within three months according to the LODR regulation. But in the company side, I think it can be till the next uh, annual general meeting. We have a time. Similarly, in case of some ESOP issue also, there are harmonization issues are there. So there are a lot of such things are there. I think over a period of time, the harmonization issues will get actually sorted out. The only question is, in case of the listed company, the dilemma comes in between what is right because many times people start arguing is the company act is supreme or LOD are supreme. There is nothing else. This is supreme or this is supreme. Both are to be adhered in such a case. In such a case, the stricter regulation has to be applied. That is very, very clear actually. So because of that, we have a lot of nitty gritties in this issue. And especially when it comes to the private limited company nowadays, the appointment per se provisions are applicable for the private limited company. When it comes to the managerial remuneration, it is something different. Because so many ifs and buts, clarity is required actually, whether it is governed and the company side, what is the article, what is the memorandum, all those things, these are all the issues which are there in case of the private limited companies. So let us get the expert's opinion because of the expert who is actually practically doing it today because although there are a lot of things which have actually changed, it will be a learning experience for me. I always believe it's a continuous learning. It is day-to-day -day learning. I many times used to talk. If you have one rupee, if I have one rupee, we used to exchange with each other. One rupee, one rupee, we don't become rich. 
still we continue to have one, one rupee only. But if Amita has one idea, if I get one idea, if we exchange both ideas, when we came, we came with the one idea. When we depart, we are becoming richer by one idea. We leave with the two ideas. The whole purpose of this seminar is that only to get the expert's opinion and also see we enrich our knowledge. So with this words, I will ask Malicha to take over the presentation. We'll go ahead. I'll take, one, I'll take yeah. one minute uh, before Malia start. When Sudhagarji is there, I think, uh, Sudhagarji, are you there? I think he left. He left. Okay. I thought I will just bring when Sudhagarji is there that he uh, there is a huge discussion about 197, the entire section. Uh, other than section one would be applicable to a private limited company or not. And second about the recovery of uh, excess remuneration, which has been paid in two situations when it is excess paid or in a situation where there is a one, I mean, uh, the section says that 102 says that explanatory statement should disclose all detail. And sometimes if it is not disclosed under section 1024, there's a power that they have to refund an excess and they have to give away to the company whatever benefit they have uh, got due to such non-disclosure and uh, the shareholders cannot take a adequate decision about their appointment. So those two points, I thought when Sudhakar is there, I will uh, discuss. Very interesting, nevertheless, uh, very interesting point you shared that the uh, importance of sharing detail in explanatory statement. Yes. And if you miss that, it turned out to be such a fatal that they have to return. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, participant really benefited by this. Even I will uh, request that during PPT again, because certain people will join later, please add this point. It will be useful. Sure, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Over to Abita, Maria. Abita, yeah. one thing is there. As of now, I can see almost about 160 people out there in the seminar. Okay. So that is what is the importance of this topic. Sure. Yeah, Malia, please start yes. setting the screen, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the topic for today's seminar is appointment of managerial personnel and their remuneration. As we are all aware that directors are entrusted with the responsibility of steering the company and all its stakeholders towards growth. Considering the same, it becomes important that uh, attention is paid to their appointment, remuneration, and other related matters. Companies act uh, through uh, Section 196 and 197. Uh, talks about the appointment and uh, remuneration uh, payable to such directors. Uh, Section 197 is to be read along with uh, Schedule 5 of the Companies Act and Companies Appointment and Ma uh, Remuneration of Managerial Personal Rules 2014. We will be starting off with Section 196, which talks about appointment of managing director, full time director, or manager. Uh, according to section 196, subsection 1, first and foremost, the section lays down that a company can have either a manager or a managing director, but not both at the same time. Uh, the section specifically prohibits the simultaneous appointment of both the directors, uh, both the designations, uh, since uh, it is normally perceived that there might be not much differences between their roles, as uh, Sudhakar sir had already mentioned before. However, there are certain differences uh, in, however, there are major differences in the roles which are being played by the managing director and the manager as uh, has been laid down in the definition, first of all, that a managing director is a director who is appointed either by an AOA or an agreement by the company or by the members or the board of directors and is entrusted with substantial powers of management of the affairs of the company. However, a manager is an individual who handles the affairs of the company under the control and supervision of the board. Further, uh, do you, the, the I are... think, uh, yes. yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah. No, Sudhakar ji, as we discussed, no, the manager has a wider power and managing director has a not so much a wide power. He will work under the supervision and he has a substantial power, but manager is overall in charge of the company. Though it is not popular, people don't appoint, many companies appoint Managing director is a fancy word or he is under the one of the director. Manager may or may not be on the board of director, but he has much, much wider power under the act than the managing director. So I thought I'll just bring that. But Sudhakar ji has left the thought with us. Yeah, Amalia, you can proceed. Uh, yes. According, uh, then further, 
uh, adding the differences would be that a managing director has to be a director or a part of the board of directors of the company but the same is not applicable for a manager he may be an employee of the company but he can still be interested with the uh, greater powers as uh, uh, ma'am uh, reiterated uh, then we will be uh, moving on to subsection 2 uh, <clears throat> it lays down that no company shall appoint or reappoint any person as its md wtd or manager for a term exceeding of 5 years at a time however reappointment can be made earlier but uh, any reappointment cannot be made earlier than one year before the expiry of his term. Uh, section 196.3 talks about the disqualifications. Uh, uh, it lays down the, uh, in, indirectly, it lays down the eligibility criteria for a person to be appointed as a MDWTD. It says that any person who is, uh, who is of age less than 21 years or more than seven uh, or more than seventy years cannot be appointed as a MD or WTD. However, uh, since uh, generally saying a lot of companies appoint directors who may be of age seventy years or above, owing to their vast experiences and uh, their contribution towards the growth of the company, uh, they do desire to appoint directors who might be older than seventy years. And hence, the Companies Act has given us the provision for appointing such directors subject to obtaining uh, by passing special resolution in the general meeting. Apart from that, uh, the... uh, when you put a resolution, special resolution to the shareholders in the explanatory statement, the company need to give a justification in detail that why company thought that it will be a beneficial to the company to appoint such a person who is uh, beyond the age of 70 years that without that it would be i mean if you do not disclose that then the benefit what the person will derive he has to re uh, refund that and he has to pay back to the company under 1024 that's what the point which i was bringing and in case if the special resolution is not passed schedule 5 also i think malia will take that uh, in the next slide but even if uh, the central government also, you have to give a detailed justification that why the it will be beneficial to the company. Then only central government will also satisfy and give the approval. So now central government approval has been done away with. There is hardly in two or three situations, two situations particularly, we have to go to central government. One of them is uh, 70 years plus aged person as per schedule five also. Yeah, Malia, please go ahead. And not only that, in case of the appointment is done at the age of 67 or 68 or 69, if he is appointed for a period of five years, during the turnover of that five years, if he is actually attaining the age of 70, then in which case, by virtue of this disqualification, the day he attains the age of 70, automatically the law immediately start applying it. He is automatically ceased to lose his directorship upon appointing the age of 70. So what happens is, as uh, Amita puts it very clearly, at the time of the appointment only, somebody has to actually check it, whether in the intervening period he is uh, attaining the age of 70 or so. If that is the case, the resolution should be suitably worded, saying that during the turnover, even if he crosses the age of 70, he continues to hold the full term of the five years. So that explanatory statement also required to be made. Otherwise, people will end up with the problem. Because I think Manisha is going to discuss the case the initial stage when it came actually. Because before the law came, somebody was appointed. After the law came, people have challenged. The appointment was actually by a single judge. He said, no, no, he is he's, uh, continued to be there because it has taken before the law is introduced. But the, subsequently, the collective bench, they had so no, sorry, the law is actually competitive. This is automatically ceased. That judgment has also come. I think you are discussing, I believe, Manisha later. Yeah, and the so point this is, uh, care has to be taken. And the resolution should be a special resolution with respect to the age. Otherwise, it could be ordinary resolution, of course, within the remuneration limit. Uh, yeah. Or we have to take care that it is a special resolution. Yeah, Malia, please go. Uh, apart from the age criteria, uh, the uh, proposed director should not be an undischarged insolvent. He should not have suspended payment to practice. <coughs> and should not be convicted by a court for an offense and sentenced for more than six months. Uh, apart from this, Schedule 5 also lays down certain specific disqualifications. 
uh, for a director and it lays down that he should not have been sentenced to jail or fine for more than rupees 1000 uh, under a specified prescribed 19 acts a list of 19 acts has been specified in schedule 5 moreover he should not have been detained under uh, the kokoposa act of 1974 as mentioned earlier he should not be less than 27 21 years old and should not be more than 70 years old again subject if it is subject if he has been appointed by a by passing a special resolution in the general meeting and he should necessarily be a resident of india i'll just just uh, just go to that slide while you i'll just discuss this point uh, second point First, we understood he has been not sentenced to any imprisonment or fine more than 1,000 under any prescribed 19 acts. And this is a conviction and offense. So when there's a conviction of offense, he has to be, he is automatically disqualified. But many people ask question, what about the compounding under the Companies Act? He's not been convicted. Convicted, I went for the compounding. So obviously then he's not been disqualified if it is a compounding. Conviction and compounding both are different meaning. So one should not get um, confused here. Uh, second point, he has been detained even for a, any period under Kofi Posa, he is disqualified. There is no uh, number of minimum six months or any fine or anything. If he is detained for a single day or single period also, he is not, he is not uh, qualified to become a managing director. With respect to 21 and 70 years, already we discussed a special resolution, central government approval. The last point, he is not a resident in India. I believe under section one, there is again a, a two school of thought. Section 197, uh, sorry, 196, 4 and 5 is exempted to a private limited company. So schedule 4 5, whether it will be applicable part 1 or not is also a debatable question. Uh, one school of thought and one group of people are thinking that 197, 196, 4 and 5 is not applicable to a private limited company, specifically from the 5th June 2015 amendment notification. So even part 1 is also not applicable to any private limited company. So private limited company are free to appoint even the non-resident person also who is overseas residing there and he can be a managing director. But the second school of thought is still under the view that 197, uh, 196.45 is not applicable, but 197 rest of the section talks about the company and not the private limited company. So in a stricter view, they are saying part one of schedule five is still applicable. So this is again a uh, school two school of thought. I thought I bring to the uh, table. Uh, These points are to be discussed. Well, uh, right, any of your you, view? No, you are actually right, Amita. If you actually see the section, normally the section reads no company. The starting point is that no company shall. That is the way the wording is there. When you say no company means irrespective of private or public or unlisted listed, everything comes under that. I agree with you actually. This is, uh, you know, people thinking is different, but the thing is, if we really strictly look into it, it applies because it is saying very categorically. It is not, uh, you know, specifically spelling out. What is not specifically spelled out, you cannot take it for granted. That is it. Uh, no, sir. 190, 196, 4 and 5 specifically not applicable. And 197, if you look at the 197 entirely, it's uh, talking yeah. about the remuneration. And yeah. further, that's not for the appointment. And there the schedule 5 is there. But I think the law of interpretation, you have to see the 197 is only for a public limited company. Most of the, Correct. if you see the sequence, so whether Schedule 5 Part 1 is applicable to a private limited company or not, I it's a it's a mixed view and uh, we will no, go normally fact, at the stricter view that we should not, uh, we should rather comply with Part 1. But I think even if you do not comply, I think very nicely Dr. Chandratre's uh, view also I have seen in 2020 in one of the webinars. He was also of the view that it is not applicable because specifically 197 is in the, the flow of the entire section is providing for the public limited company. But nevertheless, I, I, I leave that point here and uh, for the discussion later in detail about the interpretation I, of law. Yeah. I also agree, really speaking, 196 per se is applicable as per the private company. But when it's come to the remuneration part of it, 197, it is not applicable. Yes. As far as the private limited company. That is there. So the, the fourth condition under the part one schedule five of a manager being in more than one and drawing, uh, that still continues, right? Yeah. After the five condition. Yes. I see only four. The, the fifth condition is still remains or not? No, that fifth part one fifth is deleted. It's not there. 
Now only four conditions are there. Yeah, Malia. A further, in case of listed companies, SEBI LODR regulations also lays down, as uh, Amita ma'am had already uh, uh, st stated earlier, I just reiterated, that no listed entity shall appoint or continue the directorship of any person as a non-executive director who has attained the age of 75 years unless a special resolution is passed to that effect and reasons for such appointment have been laid out in the notice calling the general meeting or justifications have been specified as to what benefit uh, such a director would bring to the company as Amita Ma'am had already uh, mentioned the same. Again, here this is for the non-executive director, the entire today's presentation is normally for MD and uh, uh, WTD, but good Malia, you took out this point also that LODR says 75 years limit for the non-executive directors and Companies Act says about the managing director 70 years term. So good you have clarified that with this slide. Thanks, go ahead. Uh, in for, to further expand on the same, uh, as uh, Bala Sir had mentioned, this is the case law. In, uh, in the case of Sridhar uh, Sundarajan versus Ultramarine Pigments Limited and uh, Rangaswamy Sampath, the division bench on Bombay High Court concluded that appointment of MD when he was below 70 years prior to 1st April 2014 would disqualify him subject to a special resolution passed by the company. Then uh, we have the appointment of uh, MDWTDO manager. The uh, MDWTDO manager shall be appointed by passing a board resolution in board meeting and subsequently a uh, resolution shall be passed in the general meeting uh, approving the appointment of the said director. The notice calling the board and the general meeting shall include the terms and conditions of such appointment like remuneration and other related matters. And MR1 shall be required to be filed within 60 days of such appointment. Further, uh, uh, in case a contract of service has been executed or memora uh, has been executed. Oh, there is a problem in Mumbai. I have something to be seen. Has been executed between the manager and the company. Then the copy of the same shall be maintained at the registered office of the company. And this provision, specifically this one, shall be applicable only to the private companies. Sorry, public companies. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, this the is not applicable companies. to private limited companies. Section 190 says about the uh, applicability that the contract or agreement specifying the terms and condition to be uh, executed between the company and the managing director, WTD or manager, but this is not applicable to private limited private companies. Companies. It is other way around. You missed that not applicable. No problem. But one more point, I'll bring it here that MR1 to be filed within 60 days and one more form MGT 14 also you need to file and as per section 1173 uh, 3C, I believe, for uh, MD. It says only for the managing director, not for the full-time director or the manager. So MGT 14 also you need to take care as per section 117 from the date of appointment yeah uh, sec, uh, the next uh, subsection lays out the validity of the act of uh, md wtd or manager it states that if any appointment of uh, md or wtd or manager which had been approved by the board of directors but which has not been so approved by the members will not render any act done by such uh, md wtd or manager as invalid I have laid down the example which states that if Mr. Gautam had a, have, was appointed as an MD by passing a resolution subject to the approval of members in the ensuing general meeting, and he was not appointed as uh, and he was not his appointment was not approved in the said general meeting, then in that case, all of the acts of the uh, of Mr. Gautam as an MD or WTD shall not be considered invalid. They will, uh, the section grants validity to the acts of uh, the. Uh, director appointed as such. I think I will. I yeah. MR one will be filed from the board meeting date or the general meeting. I has uh, decided that we will take all the questions at the end, so we will take okay. every okay. question. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, I think if the I I just can you go to this? Yeah, we were here. So you are taking oh. in between. Then the people will ask also on your turn. Okay. So I think validity of act, no, it is coming under 196 subsection 5, which is not applicable to a private limited company. So 4 and 5, it is exempted. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. 
Malia. Uh, following are the exemptions uh, which have been granted to the following companies. Well, section 196.4 and 196.5 shall not be applicable to the private companies. Uh, section 196.2.4 and 5 shall not be applicable to government companies and 196.4 shall not be applicable to specified IFSC companies. The uh, exemptions have been granted by notification as mentioned in the slide. Uh, now we'll move on to the provisions relating to managerial remuneration as have been laid down in section 197. Uh, Overall managerial remuneration as per section subsection 1 of 197 states, the total remuneration payable by a public company to all directors, MD, WTD and manager shall not be more than 11% of the net profits calculated as per section 198 of the Companies Act. Further, uh, uh, the section specifies overall limits of managerial remuneration uh, in case uh, the company uh, general overall limit on managerial remuneration would be 11% of the net profits. In case the company has one managing director or whole time director or manager, then the limit shall be 5% of the net profits. Companies with more than one managing director, whole time director or manager, they shall have the limit of 10%. Then remuneration payable to directors who are neither managing directors nor full-time directors shall be 1% of the net profits of the company if there is an MD or a WTD. And in case there is no MD or WTD, then 3% of the net profits shall be applicable. Whether remuneration more than the above limits can be paid? Yes, but it would be subject to the obtaining the following approvals. Special resolution will have to be passed by the members in the general meeting and a prior approval shall be required from the lenders. The lenders would include uh, banks, financial institutions, uh, non-convertible debenture holders and the secured creditors of the company if applicable. Uh, the next provision states that in case an excess remuneration is drawn, the director shall refund the sums to the company within two years and uh, with, in the meanwhile shall hold the amount in the trust uh, for the company. Uh, further, the company does not have the right to waive the refund of such amount or refund of such excess remuneration unless the same has been approved by the members by passing a special resolution within two years of such amount becoming refundable. Uh, moving on to in uh, situations where there are no profits or inadequacy of profits as per section 197, read with schedule 5, part 2 of section 2. It lays down that remuneration payable to the man uh, managerial personnel or other directors and uh, wide amendments including independent directors and non-executive directors shall not exceed the limits as specified under except when a special resolution has been passed. Uh, the limits have been laid down as follows, where the cap effective capital is negative or less than 5 crores, then yearly remuneration shall not exceed 60 lakhs and, uh, in, uh, and 16 lakhs and 12 lakhs. In case of limits between 5 crore and 100 crore, it shall not exceed 84 lakhs and 17 lakhs respectively. Uh, in case the effective capital is between 100 crores and 250 crores, the limit of yearly remuneration shall be uh, 120 lakhs and 24 lakhs. And if the effective capital is 250 crores or above, then yearly remuneration shall be 120 lakhs plus 0.01% of the effective capital and 24 lakhs plus 0.01% of the effective capital as applicable. I think one minute here. Uh, I think many questions are coming. What, what is the meaning of inadequate profit? I think everybody is aware what is a loss. When company has no profit, definitely it is very clear that company is under loss. But inadequacy of profit means what? Whether what? When 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 can we say that the profit is inadequate? So I think I'll describe in such a way that it is provided under section one ninety seven that maximum total manager remuneration can be eleven percent to all managing director, full time director, and manager, including the other NED also of the net profit. But assuming that company has uh, uh, understanding with the managing director of X amount. And that X amount is 
crossing the percentage limit under 197, then it can be said that it is an inadequate profit company has. Company has not such adequate profit which will be within the 197 and so it has to fall under Schedule 5. That's an inadequacy of profit. If any more question, we can uh, take it later after the presentation is over. Yeah, over to you, Malia. Uh, further, a limit B has also been given. Remuneration which is payable to a managerial personnel or other directors, again, including the independent directors and the non-executive professional capacity. They shall be, uh, such remuneration shall be paid as per limit A specified above, provided that such person does not have any interest in a company, its holding or subsidiary companies, provided that any employee holding shares under ESOP shall not be considered to have uh, interest in company holding subsidiary associate, uh, not relate uh, the managerial personnel or the other director should not be related to the director or promoters of the company holding subsidiary during the last two years and he should possess necessary qualification and expertise then only payment of remuneration as per limit a shall be applicable uh, further schedule 5 lays down that in order to avail uh, payment of remuneration as per limit a and b the following conditions have to be complied with. Uh, approval has to be obtained from the board of directors or the NRC in case uh, section 178 is applicable. The, the company should have not committed any default in payment of dues to lenders, which include, again, the banks, PFIs, uh, the non-convertible debenture holders and the secured creditors. And in case the pay, uh, remuneration has to be paid within the limits of, uh, as mentioned in A, then ordinary or special resolution can be passed. And in case the remuneration has to be paid as per limit B, only special resolution is uh, special resolution is mandatory. Further, notice of the general meeting containing uh, uh, notice of the general meeting should contain the statement prescribing the details uh, for such payment of remuneration. I think here I'll just clarify further. Approval by the board meeting, board of directors, and NRC. The first NRC and then the board resolution both, and then it will go to the general body. If there's a default in the lenders or any creditors, financial institution, then definitely their prior approval is required. And many a time question comes whether the general meeting resolution is required prior or post facto. But obviously it should be prior approval. In case the board general meeting will not decline the resolution, then it will be a difficult situation for the company. So it is always considered as a prior approval. And in limit A, when under Schedule 5, the recent amendment, I think today is exactly one year, two years, Exactly on 18th March 2020, this amendment had come, uh, allowing uh, one more column is uh, inserted in the Schedule 5 uh, uh, Part 2 in the table limit A, what Malia has given. You, if you can go back to one slide, one more slide. Yeah, here. The column number 3 has been inserted on 18th March 2020, saying that yearly remuneration for the other than any, other than MD, that is independent directors and non-executive director, you can pay 12 lakh and up to 24 lakh. I think you choose the right date, uh, Dipti. Today is exactly two years of this amendment which has come. And so now a uh, company can remunerate its independent directors and non-executive directors also within this term. Go to the slide where. Uh, so if you want to exceed limit A, you, have, you can do by the ordinary resolution also. But if you want to double the limit, you have to take a special resolution. But in limit B, where she has discussed about the professional fees and he has no interest with the in the capital of the company and is not related to the promoter or director of anybody, then it will be definitely, and if it's related, then definitely it is under the special resolution. You have to take it. And in case if the employee being uh, uh, holding some shares under ESOP, then it is exempted. It is not to be considered up to 0.5% of the limit. Yeah, you have already covered that here. Yeah, sure. So I think that's what I thought. I'll just put it. Uh, and I believe, Dipti, uh, anybody has pertaining to this uh, condition, any query, let's take it because okay. we have to, may have to go to the slide. Many a time this uh, limit A and B are confusing. So if any participant has a question, uh, I think uh, just put it in the chat box. Or otherwise, let them unmute and say because chat box will take time. Okay. So any any question as regards this limit A, limit B, only that you we will take at this juncture. 
we are doing like a prior approval. I think one chat box somebody has asked some question. About... Uh, many are there inadequate profit and many okay. are there Amita then. <laughs> okay, okay. So inadequate profit, I think I have tried to disclose. Pro I mean, discuss properly that. I have many questions again. Oh, okay, okay. okay. So, so I think for MR1 also, I'll just clarify many questions. Yeah. About the filing of MR1 within 60 days, MGT14 within 30 days. But assuming the appointment, somebody is appointing in February, a resolution, board resolution is February, effective date is say 1st April, then of course MG, uh, the, the technical part only the MCA will not allow you because that's not yet. The date has not come. You are doing in prospective date. So you have to do effective date or the board resolution date whichever is later so if your effective date of appointment is later it will be that date but normally you should not wait till the general meeting general meeting you can take approval within three months if it is within the limit but if it is exceeding you are putting a special resolution i think it is always good to take a prior approval of the shareholders and of course for the default of lenders it's a prior approval to be taken Okay, I think no one has yeah. put the question as regards limit and all that. So we can go ahead. Yeah, Mali. Okay. Uh, in case of profits, no profits or inadequacy of profits, section three uh, gives a certain amount of exemptions where it states that remuneration in excess of limits specified in subsection two as above, like limit A and limit B can be paid. If any other company is paying remuneration to the said director, and such company is either a foreign company or is a company which has obtained members approval, provided that such amount is treated as a managerial remuneration under section 197 by such company and is within the permissible limits as specified. So, so this other company, this any other company can be other than a private limited company because for private limited company, there is no exemption. So it is any other company which is other than a private company. That's the interpretation. Yeah, Malia. Uh, further, uh, another class of companies which are allowed the said exemption are newly incorporated companies where the exemption shall be allowed to them for a period of seven years from the since it, since their incorporation. Then sick companies are also allowed the said exemption from for whom the scheme of revival has been approved. Further, a resolution uh, such a company where a resolution plan has been approved by NCRT under IBC shall also be eligible for uh, the said exemptions under section three as stated. So I think Malia, what you are saying here is in case of companies having no profit or inadequate profit, then also company can give the remuneration higher without yes. going through the entire process because it is specifically exempted by the, uh, under the schedule uh, five section number three. Yes, proceed. Uh, section 4 of uh, part 2 of Schedule 5 lays down that certain uh, excludes certain perquisites from managerial remuneration. However, it would be better to consider the definitions of remuneration and perquisites before we move on to that. Remuneration means any money or its equivalent given or passed to any person for services rendered by him and includes perquisites as defined under uh, Income Tax Act 1961. Perquisites as per uh, Income Tax Act 1961 can be defined as a casual emolument or benefit which is attached to an office or pro position in addition to salary and wages. Uh, further, the uh, perquisites which will not be allowed or shall be excluded are uh, classified on the basis of uh, the residential status of the director. If the director is Indian, then following perks shall be excluded from the remuneration or would not be considered as a part of managerial remuneration. First would be contribution to PF or any other superannuation funds. Second would be graduity, which is payable to such directors. And third would be leave encashment. In case the director is an expatriate, including an NRI director, following perks shall be excluded from his managerial remuneration. It includes children's education allowance, holiday passages, and leave travel concessions. Uh, section 5 of Part 2 of Schedule 5 talks about remuneration which is payable to managerial personnel uh, if he is employed in two companies. It lays down the restriction that if he is drawing remuneration from bo uh, both the companies, then the total remuneration drawn by him should not exceed the higher maximum limit which is admissible from either of the company. 
then uh, we have uh, remuneration in terms of it, which would be applicable to listed companies in terms of SEBI LODR regulations. It says that remuneration which is payable to a single NED in case such a remuneration exceeds 50% of the total remuneration payable to all the NEDs, then such uh, remuneration shall require the approval of shareholders by passing a special resolution and it shall be required to be obtained every year. So I think just elaborate by giving some examples. So if there is a, uh, you have permitted to give the say 5% total or maybe any amount number, if we talk about the number, if we agree that one crore will be paid to entire NED and one person is getting more than 50 lakh, then company has to go to the shareholders every year on year, not just once you can take for the entire term or you have to go each year with a special resolution approving that one particular NED is getting higher than half of the amount to entire one. Every year counts from, somebody has put the question, every year counts from the date of the resolution or you can take as a financial year, which year you are paying. Normally they are paid always in the financial year. Yeah, this, is this is probably in the earlier days what people used to do. There is a one uh, director, 5% is actually payable to them. Hmm. But if the more than one director, to, together, put together, 10% is payable to them. So what they used so they, they used to appoint another person as a namesake, as a director, and you pay him only one or two percent, the rest of the thing goes to these persons. You know, it's a bending of the law. That is what uh, it used to be there. Probably this all regulations have come because looking into these practices, they want to actually block it so that, you know, the total transparency is known and disclosure made to the shareholder. What is done is done under the in the instruction of the shareholder. That is what probably the regulation is beginning strict up. Absolutely, Balaji. Uh, the people try to circumvent the provision and then the regulator will come with a stricter view and that's how this amendment has come that exceeding 50% if one person will take, then every year you have to go to the shareholder. Not only that, what happens is there are many such uh, things and the procedural issues, etc. Because of some few people's uh, undoing it, all the people are to suffer. That is the problem. True, true. Absolutely. Yeah, that's how Anna. the regulator keep changing because of experience. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. Bala, may, my, may I add something here? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yes, Nikhil, yeah. welcome. See, now, now in income tax act, uh, the gift about 1,000 or 5,000, I don't exactly recall it, but uh, will not be more than 5,000. If it is given to the employees, it is treated as funds. So, as you know, Indian companies have a habit of giving sweets or some mementos, etc. on completion of 10 years, 15 years, and on the Diwali, Christmas, etc. So if this exceeds, then it is treated as a perk. So we'll have to be very careful because of this, we are not exceeding limit and then it will uh, trigger uh, approval of the shareholders. That's just Absolutely. I wanted to... I think the very good case. point. Huh? <laughs> you have put the correct point because you know, Maliha already mentioned the perk which it should be as per rent. As, as per ITA, exactly. Tax. So yeah, in so the now, income tax act, you have to keep changing. We as a company secretary sometimes just stick to the company's act, but definitely when there is a numbers and remuneration, you have to keep a watch on the income tax provision, which perquisites are exempted, or you have to add that amount in your uh, total remuneration and understand whether you have to go and reach out uh, to the shareholders or not, in which kind of a resolution. This procedural part will come later, but yes, your... First, we have to ascertain whether any such perks has been earned by the, and particularly for uh, directors, etc., if they receive Absolutely. because of their position from outsider, outside the company also might be treated as a perks. So that is where the practical challenges will be there. Sure. That's Thank what you. I just wanted to talk. Thank you. With, with Thank the you due sir. respect to all the professionals, some other what happens is the majority of the people uh, in the company secretary profession, including today's younger generation, we think we are responsible only on the company side and nothing else. We don't look beyond that, either the financial aspect or income tax aspect and other thing and all. When it comes to things, we think it is a responsibility of, you know, chief financial officer or something like that. That should not be the case because we are all actually expert in the corporate laws. We are not only concerned with the company's law. And not only that, the 2013 Act itself has actually mentioned the function and duties of the company secretary the company secretary has to ensure, he need not comply everything, but he has to ensure the company complies all the applicable laws to the organization. In view of that, I think what you are saying is in nitty gritties, et cetera, every aspect, 
either it is an income tax or it is a company tax or it is any other tax which is affecting that need to be looked into because our thinking should be more wider now actually this is a compliance of companies act only but companies are itself defines perks as per the income tax income tax act yeah. so, so i think yeah, somebody so, has no no so what I, I, see what i am trying to tell you is when it is coming to the income tax act we think okay somebody will look into the matter because income tax is not my right thing we take it right yeah yeah that, that means, laxity that, that, that laxity that, is that, not allowed yeah that is what i am coming to yeah so i think one question has come nikhil that oh, even if the perquisites given in kind or payment to the cook and the gardener whether that will also come as a remuneration according Absolutely. to income tax in according yes. to income tax act anything given in excess i mean anything given where it is mentioned it is a perk then you have to put a value to it whatever is exempted under company under the income tax act you can exclude but rest you have to include under your remuneration That's and right, uh, yeah and as then calculate your who can gardener is concerned you are paying them the salary which otherwise the director is or employee is supposed to pay he is getting so the benefit that, out of exactly. it exactly so that that is his personal expenditure so he say many times if you pay that personal insurance even so that similarly, will count as are, a similarly we are, we are talking about the ex part some benefits are exempted particularly under schedule 5 which maliya already mentioned about the ex part certain benefit of traveling for kids and education and their traveling are free that you cannot put a value and add it because the act itself says that it is not part of the perquisite though it may be under the income tax act so one has to look into the perquisite properly uh, considering the companies act exemptions and the income tax exemption and put the value to it come to the uh, derive to that number what number you are going to give and then calculate whether it is exceeding uh, your uh, num profit and uh, profit also some people have put in the chat box profit to be calculated of the previous financial year because suppose you are appointing somebody on 1st april 2023 so you have to calculate as on 1st april previous financial year which is available so assuming you don't have the availability of 31st march 2022 result the previous audited financial is uh, 2122 so you have to i mean sorry uh, yeah 21 22 so you have to calculate as per that immediately preceding financial year your calculation should be because you don't know what this year you will be and so naturally people should generally pass a resolution in a para saying that in case of inadequacy of profit definitely it will fall under minimum remuneration as per schedule 5 what? that para if you have not included in your drafting then you will be in a difficult situation in case company is in future after one or two year will have a inadequacy of profit then you have to go to the shareholders again so precaution to be taken for identifying the numbers then the process and the drafting all required to be in sync with the understanding of the law yeah additionally what is a secretary you can take a declaration from all the directors that they have not received any gift box exceeding that 1000 or 5000 what is exempt limit under the income tax I think Nikhil, that would be too much stress. You can always check with your, that nobody is going to give. You can't reach out to your non-ED and executive director sometime in a listed company. But it's a good suggestion. But if it is not possible to get the declaration, always in your accounts and to the uh, secretary department and finance department should be well aware of this thing. Yeah, that is then they should be instructed. If any gift, it should not cross. The, actually speaking, uh, I always tell that any limit. it is not necessary company secretary department knows it is accounts and finance and the ground level people who release the money they should know because they should know that if i am crossing the limit there will be problem for the company and a secretary team so that communication at a down level is most important thing and these are the limit should be informed to them at a ground level that is the most practical way to handle this situation thanks ya yeah, mahila further uh, re uh regulation 176e lays down that remuneration payable to executive directors who are either promoters or from belong to the promoter group uh, the company will have to pass a special resolution in a general meeting if in case the company has one ex one such executive director his annual remuneration exceeds 5 crore or 2.5% of the net profits of the listed entity whichever is higher or in case the company has more than one such executive directors then aggregate annual remuneration to such directors if it exceeds 5% of the net profits of the listed entity provided that such approval of payment of remuneration 
shall be applicable only till the expiry of the term of such directors. Further, the net profits as are stated in here shall be calculated as per section 198 of the Companies Act. So here you don't have to go to the shareholders every year on year. If it is valid for his term of five year and you are in the third year, then the, it will continue for the next two years. But after that, definitely you have to go to the shareholders for special resignation. I think this is very clear because if he is a promoter and promoter group, he cannot exceed a certain percentage. Any query here then, or you can go ahead. Yeah, Malia. Uh, coming back to section 197. Uh, if Before you start this, no, I think there are many questions coming here. What is, no, no, the next slide only. What are the remuneration which is not covered or which is called as a, any other capacity or the professional uh, services? There are a lot of uh, questions, even under the 1956 Act also, there was a separate section, Dipti must be aware, section 309, where we used to go to the central government to get the exemption that we have a professional capacity like a solicitor, come chartered accountant, company secretaries, engineers, now maybe a register value also could have gone. But these are all the specified profession where they can separately charge uh, separate fees for their professional cap and a professional capacity. And this will be excluded from the remuneration calculation. And this uh, March month, uh, Charter Secretary, Mr. Ramadas Kalidas Ji has put very nice detailed article on that. If anybody is interested, they should must, if there is a question, I think he has given a lot of case laws also here. One can go that. I think over to you and we'll discuss again on this slide, Malia. You just complete your slide and then we'll discuss one more time. Please. Uh, the section states that remuneration shall be inclusive of the remuneration payable to the director for services rendered by him in any other capacity. However, uh, any other capacity shall not be included if the services rendered are of professional nature and in the opinion of the NRC or the board of directors as applicable, the director possesses the requisite qualification for practice of such profession. So earlier, we have to go to the opinion for the central government to opine whether such person is having a professional capacity or not. But now I think central government has done away with all the kind of approvals, except in two matters where there is a, a non-compliance of part schedule five and uh, schedule five part one, or when there is a exceeding the age limit, uh, nothing else. And uh, the remuneration, whatever we give in the professional capacity should be approved by the NRC. NRC is given a cast a responsibility to define whether that person is really having such kind of a professional capacity and professional nature because under 1956 act we have seen under the disguise of having the professional expertise people used to charge and then consider this is outside the remuneration limit and so this amendment has come under the companies act 2013 i think bala sir can add here maybe some case law uh, i believe bala sir in one of the article has also mentioned uh, one case law Balasar, over to you. Yeah, as you rightly said earlier, you know, this particular section was actually misused by the company. Because they thought the moment we call it, we are paying a professional services to him, then it is automatically get exempted and the managerial remuneration we need not uh, go for him. That was the thing that was they were actually doing it. So because of that only, the all the approval procedure, they, that everything which has actually come into now, government, because again, the ease of doing the business, they said, okay, it's all right. You have a expert people who are in the nomination remuneration committee, which has been given the very higher responsibility in terms of the assessing the skill metric, necessary expertise, etc. If they are satisfied, if they say they are having the requisite qualification in the practice, in such cases, and such cases only, this will be getting exempted. That is what they have actually brought in to ease the things and getting away the government approval procedure. So in case if my private limited company or public limit, assuming a public company, there is a MD who is expert in the software and he is a coding. And my company is also in that. Instead of going to anybody else, why not I can approach to my MD? So this is this is acceptable. You can reach out to your MD, pay a separate professional fee, but then definitely it will come under your related party transaction also for a listed company for sure, for unlisted company also. And if there is a provision of 177, 178, both applicable, you have to go and get the approval of your related party transaction under audit committee and for paying a remuneration to the NRC. So both 
approvals are required but definitely you can pay instead of reaching out to the outsider why not i can pay to my managing director who is a capability to develop or any other executive director so that's the reason it is allowed permitted subject to the approval of nrc and audit committee as a related party so there are in this in this capacity when you are paying a remuneration plus professional fees definitely there will be a 188 related party transaction will get attracted yeah mr one more, one more yeah. thing is here because now you know what happened the entire responsibility has been actually thrust upon on nomination remuneration committee but earlier i remember in the 1950 cc act we also had such a situation we had one of the non executive director who was very expertise in the marketing field actually we wanted to get the job done from him especially you know developing our market in the global arena so we thought he is having expertise he has already handled the things etc why not we do it but that time it was requiring the government approval so yes. getting the government approval was actually really really a marathon task it is not that easy to get the government approval because there are a lot of justification even if you make application give the thing immediately you get the letter which is specifying some 35 item tick mark please permit this permit this permit this permit this all the things will come that is the way it has happened but in spite of all those things since we are genuine we are able to do although it has taken a time we could get the approval we could pay now probably that commercial procedure has been actually done away with that but here i would definitely say the responsibility costed upon this expertise people again we should do the right thing doing the right thing not bending the law because people will always find out bending the law that should not be the case one point to be noted is that possesses the requisite qualification they have mentioned qualification so the judgment of qualification because many times the question also used to ask that it's not necessary always the qualification certain things can be based on experience but still here they have mentioned the qualification so leverage is given but still it is on to no, nomination remuneration to decide did they have requisite qualification they insisted qualification always yeah thank you yeah maliya just carry on with your presentation yeah uh uh the following slides will lay out the interplay between 196 197 and 188 as amita ma'am pointed out the transaction uh, the payment of such fees to md in his professional capacity would be subject to obtaining approvals uh, approval of the audit committee would be required as the same would uh, become a related party transaction approval of the nrc would be required as uh, mentioned above then approval of the board would be required if the same is not in ordinary if the set uh, payment uh, of remuneration is not in the ordinary course of business and is not at an arms length and further approval of the members would be required if it is exceeding the threshold limits so i think i'll just take a uh, one minute here somebody has put in the chat whether md is a full time employee then why he will take a separately he will be given a professional capacity some work but definitely you can reach out to your md outside the your scope of the business and whatever under the employment agreement is agreed to if he has to spend a separate time and uh, uh, separate time for your project a separate project has been taken up and md is available and giving extra time apart from his employment time then definitely you can appoint uh, separately your md as a professional capacity also and if it is an ordinary course of business and arms length then you don't have to go and take a 188 approval but definitely you have to go to the audit committee and nrc board resolution may not be required and exceeding the threshold limit of 188 as per the is mentioned under the rules then you have to definitely go to the shareholders also so if there is many more point or question and i am missing on the chat we'll take it up later uh, remuneration to kmp is rpt no remuneration of kmp falls under the nrc's purview and uh, uh, again Uh, again there are some it's very circumstantial but kmp remuneration definitely it is a nrc's work nrc scope yeah uh, further uh, yeah. payment of uh, commission to the non executive directors since uh, the, these transactions have been approved or the payment of such commissions have been approved uh, by the members in the general meeting under section 197 and uh, regulation 17 of sebi lodr a uh, separate approval under section 188 of the companies act would not be required so many times this question also comes that payment of commission i have included in general meeting whether it is a rpt or not 
but already you have reached out to your shareholders for the commission payment in excess of limit or within the limit, then there is no need for a, it's not a RPT. That's a clarification because these questions keep on coming. Uh, further, uh, approval of appointment and remuneration only on the appointment of a person as a MD or WTD or manager, he will become a, re a related party. And hence, he is not a related party and the transaction is neither a related party transaction nor a transaction with a related party. So I think many times this question also comes a transaction for appointment of a person. While you are appointing, he is not a related party. After appointment, he becomes a related party. And so appointment is not a transaction with a related party. And so as the remuneration, because at that point of transaction, he is not a related party or neither it can be considered that transaction with a related party. So first time the transaction, it is not a related party transaction. Next. Uh, further, uh, these are the case laws uh, on uh, which have further enhanced the nuances of excess remuneration provisions as we discussed above. In uh, Swiss and Textile Bearings Limited versus Union of India, it was held that any act done by a director, though helpful to the company but involving financial liability, would not amount to service rendered and uh, further limited the meaning of the word service. In Ramaben A. Thanawala versus Jyoti Limited, it was noted that large amounts may be paid to the directors in the guise of these amounts being remuneration for the technical or expert knowledge of the director in professional capacity. For yeah, the, this was really a misuse. That's why this regulations have come. Yeah. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, further, in Ruby Mills Limited versus Union of India, it was held that if a director renders professional services as a qualified professional, such professional services would be dehorse his directorship and dehorse his directorial or managerial services. Uh, further, uh, the provisions have laid down the quantum of uh, remuneration and setting fees per se that would be payable to the directors. The uh, set fees would be direct decided by the board of directors subject to the maximum limit which can be paid to one director that would be rupees one lakh. Further, the directors can be paid such remuneration either on a monthly basis or they can be paid a percentage of the profits on a yearly basis or a combination of both of this uh, above mentioned modes can be used. Further, we uh, state that remuneration which is payable to an independent director. Uh, the Companies Act specifically includes sitting fees, reimbursement of expenses for attending board or other meetings, and profit-related commission as may be approved by the members. Under uh, further, SEBI LODR reg uh, regulations also lay down specific uh, rules for such payment of uh, sitting fees to the directors, including the uh, non-executive directors and independent directors. Sitting fees, which uh, shall be, as mentioned, recommended by the board of directors, which shall be subject to approval of shareholders. But it says that if the uh, payment of fees is within the limits of companies act as mentioned above, that is one lakh rupees, then no separate uh, shareholder approval will be required. Further, uh, stock options as a part of remuneration are allowed only to the non-executive directors. Uh, SEBI LODR regulation specifically bars uh, uh, giving stock options to the independent directors. However, the Companies Act allows uh, uh, giving stock option to independent directors. I think there is a mismatch here under the understanding. Uh, the, I mean, not understanding, but the Companies Act has allowed that independent director can be remunerated by giving a stock option. But so far in LODR, it is not allowed. It's barred. So uh, once it I, will be allowed in the income tax, uh, I mean, the LODR also, then it will be okay. This amendment has also come on the 18th March 2020. Yeah, I think over, over a period of time, it will get harmonized actually, because yeah. normally they are harmonized in over a period of time. So what will get aligned a little later? As, uh, I, I think the problem would be that uh, most of the time the independent director will come on board with the vast experience. They are a, they are in the phase of life where they want immediate money because the stock option will be over a period of three years to five years. They may not opt and they may not like it. That's the reason it is not very popular in India. But I think time will come when the stock option also be, will be a very lucrative kind of a remuneration to IDs. Yeah. Uh, that means Amitaji, currently LODR is applicable only to the listed company. 
So all non-listed company can still give the SO to the other directors. Yeah, but non-listed company, the exit would be very limited. No, for a private true, limited true, company, true. they are free, but that but would be, be good for the startups. Yeah, 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 of course, yes. And they do not require, also startup do not require ID. ID also required by certain class of company, which is in the higher, uh, It's it may not remain by then private or a startup. So the provision also will be applicable 149 to have an independent director on your board. Yeah, Malia, please go ahead. Further, uh, companies act uh, further 197 lays down the following disclosures which need to be made in a board's report in case of listed companies. Uh, the board's report should disclose uh, the ratio of remuneration of each director to the median employee's remuneration, percentage increase in remuneration of each KMP, percentage increase in the median remuneration of employees, number of permanent employees, average percentile increase already made in salaries of employees other than the managerial personnel and its comparison with the percentile increase and affirmation that the remuneration is as per the remuneration policy approved by the NRC. Further, uh, the uh, listed companies are also required to disclose uh, their top 10 employees in terms of remuneration. They are further classified as uh, according to the term of their employment. If they have been employed throughout the year, then uh, if their uh, total remuneration is not less than 1.2 crores, then their amount has to be disclosed. And if they are employed for part of the year, then not less than 8.5 lakh rupees per month, such amount and uh, employees need to be disclosed in the board's report. So I think this uh, board's report, if you look at uh, rule number 52 of the rules, it is only said about the listed company, not every company requires. So unfortunately, there is a drafting error under rule five. In rule five one, it says a listed company. Rest of the rule, they say that's the company. So how to interpret? But I think general practice is to consider that this rule is not applicable to unlisted companies. But there's a drafting error in the rule, rule five. Yeah, Malik. Uh, moving on to section 197 again, where any uh, DNO insurance, which means default negligence or offense insurance, is taken by a company on behalf of its KMP for indemnifying any of them against any liability in relation to the company, the premium paid on such insurance shall not be treated as a part of the remuneration payable unless the director is proven guilty. So here the example is like, suppose the company has a DNO proof uh, insurance and the huge policy, I mean, the premium amount is getting paid. As long as they are not guilty by maybe fraud or uh, uh, their mm -hmm. negligence, then it is uh, that premium amount is not to be included in the remuneration. It is exempted. But in case if they're proven guilty later on, then it is again, it will be added back to his remuneration. And in case after adding back, if the remuneration exceeds the threshold and if you have not approved, got the approval of the shareholders, he is liable to refund that amount. So just be careful about that in case of any fraud or anything, you have to call back that amount as his part of remuneration and not exempted remuneration, the premium amount. Yeah, yeah, Malia. Uh, further, 197 uh, requires a report, uh, so reporting by a statutory auditor. It states that the auditor of the company shall in his report under section 143 make a statement as to whether the remuneration paid by the company to its directors is in accordance with the provisions of this section, that is section 197, and whether remuneration paid is in excess of the limit laid down under this section and uh, provide such other details as have been sp uh, specified and prescribed. So this is also coming under the CARO report that a statutory auditor has to report whether it is in compliance with the provision of the LODR or Companies Act and income tax altogether. So it is within the limit or not. Yeah. Uh, further uh, following uh, states the exemptions which are given to uh, the companies. Nidhi companies are not required uh, for Nidhi companies. Section 197.1 would not comply. Uh, uh, government company section 197.1 would not uh, apply. So even for private limited, there is a separate exemption and government companies also separate exemption of 5th June. In addition, there is a, I think this is, you are talking about 5th June 2015 exemption, yes. right? Yes. Sure. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this slide lays down the penalty for contravention of uh, provisions mentioned in section 197. 
uh, it states that if a person has made the default for uh, complying with the uh, provisions, it uh, he shall be liable for payment of a penalty of rupees one lakh. And if the company is in default, then uh, the company shall be liable for payment of penalty uh, amounting to rupees five lakhs. I think we will just take up any FAQs and try if uh, the in the chat box we will take the question. So for this FAQ, so normally these are the questions which is coming that is the explanatory statement, if the explanatory statement does not provide sufficient disclosure, then uh, refer section 102, subsection 4, it says that the, whatever benefit the person has derived that he has to repay, repay back to the company, which we have discussed in the beginning of the session, but I think uh, we'll again repeat. Uh, can non-resident director be appointed as a managing director by a private limited company? Yes according to my uh, li liberal view, but stricter view that Schedule 5 Part 1 is applicable, so you have to appoint a non-resident director only. It's a, again, we discussed that it's a two school of thought and uh, no clarification unless the ministry comes out with some clarification that 197 entirely is not applicable to the private limited company. But according to 196, 4 and 5 is not applicable, so Schedule 5 is also not applicable to private limited company, including Part 1. Uh, already we discussed about the professional fees paid to the any director is exempt. Yes, if he's in a professional capacity and NRC or the board forms its opinion that he is having a professional expertise, then it is not part of his remuneration as a director. Definitely it may come under the uh, under the remuneration, but it is exempted under the remuneration. Again, we must discuss about the place of profit also for the directors as is relative. Anybody is appointed, then it will fall under section 188. Uh, as a place of profit, if he derives anything over and above the what is entitled as a director. So I think one has to refer place of profit also and understand uh, whether the audit committee approval is also required. Or Question many times come with the, can the appointment of managing director be retrospective? I am in the mid of January and then I say, okay, my director is appointed in the previous first April because I want to pay him compensation for the entire financial year. Can I make appointment from my for my MD? from the retrospective. So two aspects. One is anything retrospectively, how you can uh, show that he justify that he has uh, done his duties during that period and you are he's entitled for his remuneration. And the second, how can you file the form also now with the penalty? That's a procedural part, anyone, uh, including that the penalty or the additional fee you will file. But, file, but the managing director is a role where he has to uh, be in the power of the or the. Uh, substantial power of the managing of the affairs of the company. How would you justify that during the past period also he was having that power? So according to my uh, good governance practice and uh, corporate also good governance practice, you should not appoint anybody from the retrospective. It can be prospective. So the question comes if he is a prospective, effective from 1st April 23 and I pass the resolution say in March today because my board is not able to meet in the very, very near future. So assuming I pass in the February also, so that will be effective from 1st April. So you are entitled to file the form only after 1st April, saying that uh, effective date is 1st April. Is appointment, appointment cannot be retrospective. It cannot. But be if during the tenure, if you want to revise his salary, that's any possible. revision in the salary, that can be with a retrospective effect. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's absolutely. So thanks for bringing out that point. I think the appointment we are talking only appointment cannot yeah, be retrospective. Correct. Appointment cannot Point be retrospective effect. Revision, revision yeah. can be retrospective effect. Yeah. Always, pro I think remuneration, we can give retrospective because entire year basis on his performance, we give commission. Correct. So it can be for the past performance of the previous financial year. Also, we can give a bonus or performance link bonus or anything. We already discussed about the conviction and the compounding. Conviction is by the, uh, by the it's a criminal offense and by the court, whereas the compounding is by the regulator, not by the judiciary. And then if the compounding is done, then he has not been disqualified. Section 190 also is exempted to private limited companies. So the execution of any agreement, memorandum or terms and agree, uh, condition of the appointment of managing director, whole time director is not uh, required. I think some questions are coming from the chat box. Kindly put on the chat box, we'll take one by one. Your last question left, whether CEO can be treated no, as... No, no, I am taking the question uh, on the slide only. Whether CEO can be treated as manager 
I believe it's uh, many times misunderstood, but CEO is a KMP, whereas manager is a wider power. Manager is having power in lieu of the managing director. You can have a CEO and a MD also sometimes the same designation, but manager and MD you can't have. So CEO cannot be considered as a manager. Both are different term, though we need to, some more time to discuss about that. But CEO always generally report to the board of directors and the MD also report to the board of directors, but manager has a supreme power, though he works under the supervision of the power of the board, but he has a wider power than the CEO. Both are not a director. They are not in the board of director, but CEO is not manager. Manager is under the Companies Act, a separate uh, provision. And so you cannot be considered. You can give the fancy name uh, as a CEO, but uh, once you are a manager, depending on the role, one can conclude whether he is a manager or is a CEO of the company. Yeah, in public uh, eye, CEO or uh, managing director is considered to be a very big uh, position compared to manager. But that's wrong perception. I because know, manager I know. Has a wider power than the CEO. Yeah, that is a reality. But in while public understanding and public eye, CEO and managing director designation has a very good reputation. Because it's so a common reality, practice. Though in reality, manager has a very wide power. Yeah, because in practice, generally industry prefer the fancy term of a managing director or a CEO. And a manager is considered as he's a managing under. I mean, it's due to that very, uh, I mean, practice. We are used to of MD appointment. Can you go to the next slide? If I can take up quickly this FAQ. So Malia, can you go yeah. to the next slide? Yeah, whether the provision of any of the subsection of 197 is applicable to a private limited company or not. we There is a lot of debate unless the Ministry of Corporate Affairs comes with the clarification. The law of interpretation says that 197, all the interpretation, if you see, it's applicable to the public limited company. Sitting fees are also included here. Schedule 5 also included here. So it needs a big deliberation and I wanted that to be picked up when Sudhakarji was there but unfortunately he has left but according to my understanding we have to read 197 line by line and see as per the law of interpretation it's it's only for the public limited company with my limited understanding what I understand for what purpose now the central government approval is required central government already uh, said that they have abated all the application which was lying them when this amendment has come and now central government approval is required only in two places when it's a part of your age or uh, 70 years plus and somebody is not complying with part one of schedule five. Part two of schedule uh, five is always left open for the shareholders, even if it's crossing 11%. But if the shareholders approve the special resolution, then the limit has no such relevance now. And the schedule five limit and 11% limit can be crossed by passing a special resolution. That question was put in the chat box. So just to that reply, we don't have to go to the central government. Can non-executive directors be paid a monthly remuneration? If so, whether he will become automatically an executive director, this type of query keep coming to me also. But once you pay your non-executive director as a monthly remuneration, because the act allows that it can be there, they can be remunerated by any way, by fee, by monthly remuneration, quarterly, annual, or by way of commission, it is okay. So by just giving him a monthly remuneration, he won't be a power of the executive director. Executive director means he has a separate role to execute certain function. So he can't become an NED to ED just by paying the remuneration. Because they are the law itself, the act says that it can be they can be remunerated in any which way. Yeah. How is inadequacy determined? I think we already discussed. Inadequacy means if I have decided I will give my MD 5 crore, this year, I have a balance of which will be assuming it is a 5% and I have sufficient net profit to that. But next year, if I don't, then it will be inadequate profit. My profit will not be inadequate. Or even in this year also, if I want to give him 5 crore and my profit is less, net profit after the calculation as per section 198, then the company will fall under schedule 5 inadequacy of profit and then they have to comply with the resolution, special or ordinary as the case may be as per schedule 5. And of course, the process of law, and we have not discussed about the procedural part, but one has to go through the uh, NRC committee. And if there is a related party, then audit committee, and it is a prior approval. It can't be post facto, it has prior. Then it goes to the board. And then of course, in case of, in case of default of the creditors or lenders, you have to get a prior approval of them also. Because one side you are defaulting on the EMI or interest or the debenture interest or the debenture redemption. 
and then you can't pay to your share, your managing director. So that's very clear that it's a prior approval. In, except in case of IBC, and when the NCLT has approved specifically for turnaround of the in the resolution plan, that in case if you are inadequacy profit, but you still appoint a managing director and pay the remuneration, then it is falling under the exemption category and you can pay. And now one more question is, can a single resolution for a person to be appointed as a director and entity can be passed? Answer is yes and no both. One single resolution, you can directly appoint a person saying that he's an additional director, director and MD, but governance as a good governance, you have to appoint first as a director. Suppose during the year you are appointing him, then he's an additional director. And then you can pass a second resolution that now we are appointing him also managing director, but automatically his term will get over or the office will get over and the annual general meeting or the last date of annual general meeting due as per the company's act. So again, you have to pass a resolution appointing him as a director, again appointing him as a managing director. So that's how this... You are absolutely right, uh, Amita, because what happens is MD is selected amongst the director. First, he has to be a director. Because it cannot be director and MD together goes together. Because first he has to become a director. From the director, you select the MD. The sequence is itself is like that. Got so it. as you rightly say, first you have to be appointed as additional director. Then you can designate him as MD. Similarly, in the general meeting, first he has to become a director. Then his approval follows as the managing director. That is the sequence that is there. Yeah, so and good right. part is, yeah. As a good practice also, you can't club two or three resolutions together. If, a, if the shareholders want to uh, approve one resolution uh, for his appointment as a director, but they are not willing to appoint him as a managing director. You can't club both together. It's as a governance also, it's not allowed. And as a practice and as an act also says that first he has to be a director. So appoint him as a director. The next resolution will be a managing director. I think uh, Malia, so I missed, what happened? Uh, you have closed I, the presentation. I I, Malia? I Malia, I think. So there, there is one more question that uh, I'll just take one more resolution that uh, can we pass a resolution together in the general meeting appointing special resolution give, approving the remuneration to my managing director, non-executive directors, independent directors. Yes, you can, but as a good practice, you should have a separate, separate resolution for each one. You can't club in one resolution, entire remuneration for the board. That's a question. And I think the last one was Disclosure in the director's report, what under rule number 5.2 to be disclosed? As I mentioned, there is a drafting error under rule number 5. Rule number 5.2.1 uh, one, five, one says that a listed company requires the following disclosure. But in all other sub sub rules, it doesn't say about the listed company. It talks about company, company. So one should not get confused. I believe it is only for the listed company. I think uh, here, Amit, uh, the same question for 197. That main provisional says that public company. And the main section 197 speaks of public company. Public. All are provisions for the proviso. The provision for the proviso are to main section. So if main sections do not apply to private company, the provision for the proviso cannot apply to private company. Same uh, way. For this also, if it is applicable, main regulation is applicable to listed company, the sub-regulation is sub to the regulation. When the sub -regu main regulation is not applicable to the regulation, so I think even sub-regulation will not apply to the company other than the... Absolutely. It is a rule of interpretation. I think that's yeah, and it, it, is, uh, it is very clear because the main section or main regulation decide the position that it will be applicable to who? And once it is crystal clear, all the subsequent will be applicable to that only entity. So then the, in the subsequent sec section, they have not mentioned the listed and only company. So there are questions coming that should I, is yeah. it applicable to private? But I'm just taking this platform to give them the clarification that no, once it is not applicable to a listed company, I mean, other than listed company, then you should not comply with the disclosure with respect to the number of employees, then the median remuneration to the MD, to the rest of the employees, all those applicable provision is only for the listed entity. Yes, Malia, I think uh, any uh, more yes. slides, otherwise you can close the slide and we can take up from any, the chat. Any decided case law or something like that has come from the regulator under this rule 5021 other than the listed companies, that will be interesting mm -hmm. to know what the regulator yeah. thinks. 
not sir so far i don't think anybody has been prosecuted in a listed company in not giving the disclosure of this regulator has not so far come malia you can close the presentation and we can take up from the chat box if any questions are coming uh, anybody can uh, ask a question okay. or many are there amita straight away we can i take. will just i will go to the chat box and i'll pick up the question from the yeah, one questions. first only and then you can take it one by one in between you have replied yeah some i have replied but i think uh, i could not get the time so i think first namita, one. namita tiwari has put a question mr a a chartered accountant not in practice was a kmp in a private limited company now he becomes an a non executive director in the same company can we pay him remuneration on a monthly basis if yes under what provision is under section 197 is not applicable to private company will his remuneration qualify as a professional in nature kindly guide us on the remuneration of the non executive in a private limited company see private limited company do not forget to check your article of association my humble request to everyone most of the time my articles also sometime i have to tell them please go and check the article of a private limited company there could be some condition you never know if there is a private equity or there is a nomination director on your board there could be a restriction so please go and check your private limited company's article if article does not provide anything then i think namita section 197 is not applicable to private limited company you can pay the way you want uh, to your non executive director law very clearly says that you can remunerate your director by monthly paying quarterly annually or by percentage of the commission also so i think that answer is, uh, is very clear i think the next question is mr1 will be filed from I the board i think you already under, answered from the board meeting the date here. of appointment copy of agreement to be attached to article no how to define companies having inadequate profit we have discussed um, mgt 14 filing also uh, somebody yeah, put the question uh, filing of mgt 14 enables uh, under section 117 resolution passed so and so right with so and so manager is also a kmp why mgt 14 will not mgt 14 is not applicable to private limited company under 179 3g so 3g is exempted that's the reason mr uh, dr ravi b ravi balakrishnan i believe that question has come the next question is from lokesh sharma section 197 14 subject to the provision of this section any director who is in receipt of any commission from the company and who is a managing and the whole time director of the company shall not be disqualified from receiving any remuneration or commission from any holding company or subsidiary company or such company subject to the disclosure of by the company in the board report in above provision is commission will also cover remuneration what is the meaning of commission here commission means always a percentage of your net profit how much you are giving for the performance i think mr lokesh can be given the mic if am i understanding what he is putting the question is commission will cover remuneration mr remuneration lokesh covers commission so the other uh, question is other way round yeah yeah commission is also part of the remuneration remuneration yeah uh ritvika has put how to determine any inadequacy of the company which you already discussed we already discussed this uh, that's clear mm, effective date of appointment also we have discussed mm. obtaining approval of the shareholders for yeah any more question this managerial remuneration limit is for one uh, no Mr. before that before that dr ravi has put something a long question but md tenure expires on 31st march 23 board has approved the appointment on 20th february subject to shareholders approval for a further period of 5 years from 1st april 23 shareholders meeting is to be held in may 23 now mr1 is to be filed within 60 days from 20th february 23 date of board meeting or within 60 days from 1st april 23 i think 60 days from the date of the shareholders meeting but you cannot if you are going see one more thing we have missed out here if you are going under the part 5 i mean schedule 5 part 2 inadequacy of profit you can appoint md for 5 year but you cannot approve the remuneration for more than 3 years there is a restriction ah. there the remuneration right. can only be approved for a period of 3 years, three years. So, so i think that this question leads to that uh, one point which we have missed out but the shareholders approval should always normally should be taken within 3 months for a lodr listed company maximum but for a unlisted private public limited company you can go and take the within 3 months uh, post your board resolution but of course the effective date will start from the date when you have appointed and in case if the general body meeting declines such appointment you have to recover from your managing director the remuneration what he got and there 197 
196.5 comes that whatever he acted as a MD and whatever action that will still remain as a valid action. It will not get invalidated, but you have to get back all the remuneration back which you have given in excess. So I, I hope Dr. Bala, Dr. Ravi got the answer. Uh, the manager remuneration limit is for one manager rem person or all MD, WTD in case of one or more than one, all put together. Please clarify. It is all put together. The limit which is saying, all it is all put together. 11 person is in total, not per person. Whereas under the schedule, this also amount is as per your effective capital calculation for the overall remuneration for one person, one MD. Yeah, yeah because here the law says very categorically, if you are having one person, what is the limit? If you are having more than one person, all put together, what is the limit? Section so 197 like limit, Bala said, Doctor, uh, 197 limit is for the total remuneration, not yeah. for one person. Correct. That is right. Correct? Yeah. yeah. And uh, Schedule 5, the limit which has been given under Schedule 5, that is per person. No, sorry. Sorry. That is also to the total people, total number of people. Am I right? No, you are right. Yes, so more, yeah. than, more than one person, it is all put together. You are right. But and even in the Schedule is, 5, the limit is given, it is for all yeah. people together. Yeah. Not per person. 60 lakh rupees to 120 lakh rupees. Yeah, that, that is, is right. Just one minute. I'll just double check that. Because I have some question there. Because that, according to my understanding, it is per manager of remuneration, per person. You are talking the list A or list B, is it? Yeah, list A. Uh, list A and list B is per person. Per person. Whereas yeah, the section 197 is, is for the total number of people. Yeah, correct. Total percentage. Yeah, list A and list B is per person. Correct. Yeah. So just yeah. want to highlight that, that it's per person. Uh, what is the next question? Is Profit will be whether for the pre previous year or the current year. In case it is the current year, how to analyze inadequacy? No, it is always the preceding financial year. Schedule 5 also is clear, very See, clear. When you are actually determining it, it is actually what is the audited financial statement available for the earlier year. That okay. is the thing. But if you are talking in the current year, then the company secretary need to be vigilant. Normally, I used to monitor in the company when we were there, especially the year when recession and other things used to be there. I used to start somewhere immediately after six months only, calculate everything we are within the limit, within not the limit. Of course, that time it was 1950s, we had to go to the government approval. There also the clear-cut instruction was there. As soon as the year ended, as early as possible, based on the provincial uh, financial statement, you have to make an application. That used to be the case. Here, if the current year is there, the company secretary has to be very vigilant in all the things. Correct. Yeah. So it's the preceding financial year whose balance sheet, audited balance sheet is available to the company yeah. at that point of time when you are appointing, you have to see that preceding financial year's uh, figure. Correct. Yeah. I think uh, in case of inadequate profit, whether a company can appoint MD for five years. Okay, MD can appoint for five years, but remuneration cannot be for more for than three years. years. Yeah. In case of appointment of MD in a listed company, whether shareholders approval to be obtained in three months or can be obtained beyond three months. I think the LODR is very clear within three months you have to obtain. Yeah. MR1 filing 60 days on the date of approval of the shareholders. No, the first approval. If, if MR1 is with the board resolution, you have to accordingly we file in that way. MGT 14, MR1, everything to be filed on the board meeting. Again, you may go if it's an additional director and reappointed, we have to file DR12, but we don't file. MR1 for the general meeting because already mentioned therein, unless your shareholders approval is different than your board resolution approval. I hope I am clear on that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. In version 3 portal, effective date is not accepting as a future date. Yeah, that's done. Suppose if a company has one MD, one WTD, three ID, one nominee director and three general director, uh, non-executive director, what is the percentage of remuneration company has to pay. Company don't have to pay. Company has to decide how much they have to pay and accordingly they can remunerate to their all the board members according to 197 limit of 11%. If one director already Malia in her presentation has put 5% or 10% for the managing director one single then 5% more than one 10%. And similarly non-executive director 1% and including all directors it is 1% and 3% as the case may be. And again schedule 5 also says so I think we have discussed entire uh, percentage. So I think this question is generic, which you will see 197 and read with schedule 5. 
you will come to know that you can exceed any percentage also. You can go beyond 11% if you avail shareholder special resolution and approval for that. So I don't think any limit has any relevance now. Uh, I think... Uh, Is that limit mentioned in schedule applicable to one or aggregate? I think we have cleared that it is for one. Neeraj has put this question. Yeah. Uh, what is the relevancy prior SR in section 197? Each specified percentage of 11% is cross. Yeah, 11% can be cross. As I say, there is no relevance now remain because you can always go to the shareholder. Earlier, previously, we used to go to the general central government. In many a time, we used to go for even bonus. If I want to give a bonus, a lump sum amount, I have to justify that why I'm giving bonus to my director when the company has no provision. I mean, it's inadequate profit and it's a loss. I have to justify that I need somebody who can, and there could be a gestation period, initial three, four years. And still, I want to retain some my managing director. Power was always with the central government at that point in time. Luckily, fortunately, now it is with the left to the wisdom of the board and the shareholders that you decide what percentage of remuneration you want to uh, give to your share, your board. Can you please elaborate the remuneration of such executive posts with respect to recently revised regulation 17 of CBLODR, read with section 195? What compliance we need to be ensured? I think we already discussed about this NRC. If there is a no related party, related party, then both NRC and audit committee board go to the general body meeting and it's all prior approval. In, in listed company, any such transaction will always be a prior. You can't go to the board, approve, and then recommendation will come later. So I think in LODR uh, slides, we have discussed about that. What will be the gift by a company exceeding the limit? That also Nikhil yes, has sir. already discussed. Yeah, Nikhil has put the question, but I think Nikhil has also answered also. Um, Dear madam, if the so, company is having net profit of 25 lakh, giving remuneration overall 1 crore, which exceeds 11 percent, then the company has to see schedule 5. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, correct. You have to go to the shareholder. What is the relevance? No relevance if it is crossed. Uh, every year counts from where I think we already answered. <coughs> Somebody has replied prima facie to it seems that the act enables in almost all situations to seek the approval of the board and general body, rarely one has to go to the central government or MCA for approval. Hope it is all right. Yeah, it's absolutely all right. There is no role of central government now, at least for the appointment there is, but not for remuneration. Appointment under Schedule 5, still the provision is there. If you are not complying, you have to go to the government for getting the exemption. Assuming your one of the director is convicted, then definitely you have to go, go to central government that he is not complying of Schedule 5, Part 1. But here again, one of the situation, one question has come that my director is penalized and put behind the bar for a day or two days overseas. But fortunately here, we need to see the 19 act. Under those 19 act, if he's, if he's been uh, penalized or convicted for any offense where the penalties are all, or the fine has been paid or he was behind some time of more than six months, I believe. That's under Schedule 5. Schedule 5 state for more than no for any period i'm sorry i'll just correct myself for any period then he will not be qualified as a appointment as an md and then you have to go to the central government so central government approval is not for remuneration but for appointment yes it still remains so there are two things we are discussing appointment and remuneration yeah. so i think nitin has put is there if there are more than one executive director and together the remuneration does exceed doesn't exceed more than 5% of the net profit, but the remuneration of one of the executive director exceed 2.5%. It's if he's a promoter, executive director, but if it's a promoter, if you are talking about LODR provision, it is necessary to obtain the special resolution as per LODR for the remuneration payable to such executive director. Yes, if yeah. such executive director is a promoter director, is a promoter or the promoter group. I think Nitin, that's the answer. Uh, while in private companies, these provisions are not prima facie applicable. And in case of a closely held limited companies, approval are required to be taken at the most from the shareholders only and the board as the case may be. In case the WTD or MD, such approval are invariably taken for appointment of a period of five years at one time. So it will be for three years remuneration for unlisted public company. Hope it is okay. 
I hope there is uh, this answer is that five years and three years is clear. Appointment for five years, remuneration for three years. In case of a central public sector enterprise, that's a government company, I believe, managerial remuneration is finalized through the periodic pay revision committee. In such case, only board is approving the managerial remuneration. No approval of the shareholders through the SR are sought. Yeah, because that, there is a separate exemption given under the 5th June exemption. I think one question is coming for the GST. Please also clarify no GST is payable on payment of remuneration, but in case of payment of sitting fee payable to the director, other than the whole time director or managing director, just such GST is payable. Please confirm. See, I'm not a GST expert. Uh, you can, uh, I think it's anything GST will be pay applicable for the services. Sitting fees also, I don't know because that will come under the non-executive director. Mostly MDs are not paid Sitting fees. Sitting fees are always normally payable to the non-executive director. So no, no, no this question is this question is what this is actually on the GST. Uh, uh, he is talking about the tax payable on the remuneration. No GST. 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 GST, GST, not GST. GST. No, 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 GST on what? Sitting fees. Yeah. Uh, on sitting. Payment of sitting fees. Yes. See, when the sitting fees sitting fees goes as a remuneration, GST will not be applicable. TDS will be applicable. Only question is. Whether TDS is deductible in advance or he has to pay, that is the only question. Because no, some sir. companies deduct the TDS and some people don't deduct the TDS. GST will not be applicable in any case. It will come under the income tax as a TDS. No, sir. The question is that if the G if the sitting fee is paid to the non-executive directors other than yeah. NWTD. Yes. Yeah. So your non-executive directors are... Yeah, it is again remuneration, no? See, it is not goods or services. GST is... I think the question... Good question is services. coming. Here yes, it is sir. actually a remuneration. In case of the remuneration, whatever you earn, it will be in your professional capacity or other capacity. That will be subject to income tax. Income tax says it's the 10% TDS deduction. They are, I think the question is coming that if non-executive director, if they are raising any bill, then it will be a services added. It is considered as a services and then the GST will be applicable. So I think I'm still not, I'm seeing. Yeah, that. better we have heard this idea. I'm not a GSC expert, so I can't comment, but you have to see whether it is a, he's raising any invoice on the company and then it will be his professional fees as a remuneration and I mean, as a services, then GSC would be applicable, but not very. Can clear. I add something? Bala? Yeah, Nikhil, I was thinking of you. I wanted to call you actually. Actually, under the service tax, it was applicable. So, in fact, under the service tax, uh, there was a requirement of registration provided a uh, minimum that turnover kind of a threshold limit was there. But in case of private uh, companies, uh, what they call it, uh, reverse charge mechanism, what we have, <clears throat> all the uh, sitting fees was falling under the service tax. Now, GSA, I do not, I need to check. Now, in the question of raising bills or that is in the See, you have a contract by your passing your resolutions or by your article, if you are giving X amount per sitting fees, that itself is a contract. So, by raising bill or not raising bill will not get exemptions or make it liable. Now, my gut feeling is because it was liable for service X, might be liable for GST. I need to check because I don't practice GST. I was not practicing service tax. But uh, this Sunday, uh, like tomorrow, we have a study circle meeting for our CA on GST only. And a good friend of mine is going to lead the discussion and he writes books also. So I'll just get it confirmed from him about it. No, okay. I have, I have seen uh, this question at this juncture and then we can go ahead. Thanks yeah. again for your inputs. Yeah, Namita has put a question, but MD is in full-time employment because if we are saying about the he is given taken up some project as a professional capacity, so her question is MD is a full-time employment, but as we discussed, the project can be out of his employment hours and he can take up a separate as a project and as a professional fees we are we can appoint him as a professional capacity. Uh, regarding provision of remuneration suggestion by NRC to board and their approval of KMPs and senior management. Does it prior approval required of NRC and board? Yes, I think, uh, of course, it's always a recommendation of the NRC to the board and then board go ahead. Uh, does it require to yearly increment also? And if prior approval is required from a increment will be done when it's done after stating starting of the financial year or a year basis giving effect from the previous date. 
Thus, remuneration of KMP and its revision is RPT attracting prior approval of the audit committee. So, in the question, first question we answered that it's the prior approval of NRC and then the board it goes and purely incremental and prior approval, it is a practice how they approve. It's always as per the uh, contract or as per the provision mentioned in the resolution. So, of course, it can be incremental. But if the incremental is not approved and then later on you are revising, then it is a revision and then you have to go to the uh, shareholders again. Does remuneration to KMP is a revision in RPT? No. KMP is under the NRC's power and RPT only goes to the audit committee for prior approval. Here, Amit, I would just Pala, like sir, to... Is there any other view of yours about the uh, yearly increment? No, I think you are correct. It, it, it is covered in earlier resolution, which we generally do yearly increment. That yeah. means shareholders approval is already taken and it is always a range we put and you can decide less than what it is already provided yearly increment, but you cannot cross again one thing that is there because if, there, if you cross that also is a wrong thing. So if that range you provide, it is done. Otherwise, you have to go back to the shareholders. That is I think, uh, yeah, I agree with what you are saying. I think generally what we advise is first, about the applicability of the act. Second is a procedural part. And third is a drafting. How you draft your resolution so that you don't go back to the shareholders again and again. Right. If, you put a, if, you, if you put a cap or if you put a range, then definitely you don't have to go to the incremental for a year on year. I think that's how the drafting skill comes. So when you advise, you advise about the entire package as such. Yeah, Nikhil, you have something yeah. to add? Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, during the whole discussion, when Amitaji talks about that RPT is not applicable, now RPT has two phases. One is approval. If it is at arm length and is approval, uh, <coughs> approval from the point of view of making a payment, uh, that part of RPT is not applicable. But other part of RPT, kind of a disclosure in your financial statement, your financial statement will always be applicable. Just that's a clarification. No, that Nikhil, I will I will defer here with you. Uh, the RPT disclosure, what is required for the KMP salary is also coming from the accounting standard, not from the company's exactly. Standard. It's coming it from is not accounting under 188. Standard. It is not under 188. And under for the yeah. listed company, every uh, everything is a RPT. If you are sharing your resources, then it is an RPT. But it the provision is not coming from the company's act, it is coming via from the sta accounting standard. So that disclosure. But with respect to the RPT, uh, approval is required of audit committee only if there is a professional fees or there is a place of profit he's holding. Yeah, got it. That so that's what I said. The only disclosure part which comes from the AS19 or yeah, yeah, that, AS, right. that will always be there. So uh, this part is one. But as far as FS is concerned, where the company secretary also put a signature, so we should remember. Don't say that Amita Bhai has said that I don't disclose. So that part just we take care of. That the automatically that duty in the balance sheet, it will come in time. Yeah, but yeah. many a time, just a reference here, many a time people put in AOC2 also, whatever is in there, in the in the balance sheet schedule about the RPT, the pe people just put everything in AOC2 when we file. Uh, I don't know, AOC2. Yeah, I believe it's AOC2 only. And it is not required. AOC2 asks about section 188, whether arm's length or it is a material. Got don't it. put entire what is place in your balance sheet that's my True. my submission yeah, yeah. Uh, i think uh, can company pay more than five percent to md less than five percent to wtd if there's a managing director and a wtd on overall remuneration limit should not exceed 10 percent on the net profit i'm not getting the question but you can cross any such limit no i think what here he says is uh, like if you have two wtd and uh, you can't pay 7% to one and 3% to other and total remain 10 because it exceeds 5%. Again, whatever uh, yeah, legal approval to... is required has to be. Uh, so 197 taken. percentage, 197, the limit is separately to be calculated. If there is a one managing director, 5%. But if there is more than one managing director on WTD, they cannot cross more than 10%. 10%. And then again, you have overall, you are exceeding 10%. You have to go under schedule 5 then. So that means, Amita, in this case, I can pay 9% to one and only 1% yeah, to yeah, you can, yeah, you yeah, 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 all, yeah. all put that, together. Yes, that, exactly put together. that exactly is the query. That exactly is the query. Yeah, yeah, you, you can, can put that. See, so long as 1% is there, you have to stick to 5%. Absolutely. More than 1% right. is there, percentage can vary between them, but overall percentage should be Over is 10. Yeah, if you have Please. 3, 4, 5, but together is 10%. The that is what I was, I was mentioning also earlier. 
So what people used to do, they used to appoint one person as a director. He wants to pay him more. So the namesake, they appoint another person as a director. And Got they it. go so, up to 10%. 8% yeah, person yeah. to this person, 2% to that person. That person. Agreed. That is That holds good even today also. Yeah. So I think to reply to Sandeep's question, if I understood question correctly, you, know, you can pay in total 10%. Between that 10%, there could be two people, three people. You decide between how much they can share or what will be the percentage. Act doesn't prescribe specifically per person. They are just saying overall limit should not be 11%, 10%. And all put that together 11%. That is right. Yeah. Uh, again, Sandeep's question is, if a person be appointed as MD is also a promoter of the company, in that case, can he or other promoter group can vote on the resolution for his appointment? No. If it is a promoter and it is a listed company, he cannot, in the related party transaction, he cannot, for a lim uh, private limited, he can, after disclosure. I think that's a question, that can he or other promoter group, definitely they cannot vote for a listed company or unlisted public company also. Uh, Ami has put, as per section 197, one total remuner remuneration cannot exceed 11% of the net profit. That financial year, which financial year to be considered? I think we have already discussed about the previous. Yeah, yeah. If there are more than one executive director, uh, this is Manoj Mehta. Suppose the promoter group is they have voted in the uh, approval shareholding uh, shareholders approval process. Only the company, as per the LODR, they cannot count it. But uh, if we sometimes we say, and many people, they, they clarify that it's a democratic system and now he is exercising his voting right. Yes, so far as he is a part of the promoter group and if he even casted the vote, but that vote cannot be counted because of independence. Yeah, yeah. In, in the general so meeting. He can exercise the voting power. There is no bar. Uh, yeah. I think uh, somebody was asking something. Something was raised. Amit ji is there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amita, ma'am, I was. Yeah, just, I heard uh, your. Yeah, you please clarify. I wanted you to come in and put that who can vote, who cannot vote. Yeah. No point is very really simple. Uh, the restriction on voting is governed primarily by two provisions. One is section 188. The other is section 23. There is no other provision by virtue of which the voting restriction will come. Now, unless your transaction falls within the rigors of 188 or 23, you cannot say that the voting right of a promoter is curtailed anyway. So I am not able to find out any situation except one where your remuneration proposed to the director is crossing the threshold of materiality, that is 10% of the consolidated annual turnover. If that is the case, then only the restriction on voting by the promoters will come. Otherwise, the restriction will not come. Okay, so you mean that only when we go to the shareholders because of threshold limit across, then only it will be, he will not be entitled because Correct. it's a it's a related party transaction. But what Correct. about what about the other transaction when it is not a related party as a remuneration is getting and then he's can interested. Vote. So, so can vote. he can, can vote. vote. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No restriction. Okay. Any view on GST, Amit Ji? You have any idea about the GST? Because then uh, the next questions are many on the GST. I don't know where I have left, but. With regard to the setting fees? Yeah, with regard to the setting fee. Uh, with regard to sitting fees on GST, I'll have to check. Honestly, I okay. so we'll uh, am not. This. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. Leave. Now there the next a, question. Can pay reverse mechanism and get yeah. the conversion. Yeah, I think GST is uh, not our expert on the, this particular forum. No? So let's keep it uh, outside. I thought if you have an immediate some answer, no, let's get your views. I the uh, next question is coming from Bipin Shah. Please explain provision of appointment of full-time director of age 70 and above by private limited company. I think my opinion is 70 years and above. If you uh, have the opinion, Amitji, again, your views here, Schedule 5 to be applicable for a private limited company, Schedule 5 Part 1. If applicable, then more than 70 years, private limited company also need to go to the special resolution. And if not approved by the special resolution, go to the shareholders. But subject to a condition that you take a firm view that part uh, the Schedule 5 Part 1 is applicable to a private company. 
because section 196 4 and 5 very categorically say that 4 and 5 is not applicable to private company but then again if you go to 197 what is your view amitji whether the private limited company required to follow one uh, schedule I'll 5 i agree uh, i heard you initially also where you mentioned that there are two schools of thought which are prevailing in the market so that situation remains, but if you ask me personally, so I'll go with 196.4 carve out created by virtue of 5th June uh, 2015 notification. Very clearly, Schedule 5 is not applicable, whether it is part 1 or whether it is part 2. So private limited company, then depending by your answer is that private limited company can appoint without going to central government. Uh, Shafi Salim has asked whether in, K, in any case the KMP appointment and remuneration related resolution passed by NRC is also required to be passed in the subsequent board meeting or, or only noting of the resolution passed by NRC in the subsequent. See, resolution is not passed by the NRC. NRC recommend their uh, remuneration. Then it will always pass by the board. So it is just not the noting. The board as usually pass is approve the resolution. Yeah, yeah, NRC normally gives a recommendation for the consideration of the board. It is the board which is actually the approving other. You are right, right, absolutely. Next question is from Lokesh Sharma. A person is appointed as a hold-time director by a public company and his appointment and remuneration, one crore is approved by the member by way of a special resolution as it is exceeding the limit of Schedule 5. Now, can we propose his appointment as a WTD or a manager of a subsidiary company? And the remuneration of one crore divided into two part, one part from the holding company and second part from the subsidiary company. Will our proposal require approval of the member of the holding public company? If yes, will it be ordinary or the special resolution? See, your director can also be appointed in your subsidiary company because that doesn't mean that he will have, I think uh, this, this question is coming from the uh, unlisted company, listed company, not clarified, just a public company you mentioned. So I assume it's a public company, not a listed company. Provision may be different for a listed company, but a public limited company, if you are crossing that limit and half of both the and things. It is listed are, company, ma'am. It is listed company. <laughs> if it is listed company and your uh, shareholder of the uh, holding company has approved such resolution, then I don't think you have to go to the uh, your uh, sub sub subsidiary company. Your question is, will our proposal require approval of the member of the holding public company? Uh, no, I don't basic, think so. Basically, there are two questions. One is uh, uh, holding companies want to appoint his director as WTD in subsidiary also. First question, it, it can be appointed by the board. There is no requirement of several approval in that case. Second right. part is uh, the remuneration uh, that was payable to uh, WTD of the listed company is divided into two parts. One part will be paid from the holding listed company and second part will be paid from subsidiary company. So uh, to divide to divide their termination in two parts will require shareholders approval again. Amiji, your view or Bala sir, your view, because according to my view, holding company has already appointed him for one CR. And if I assume the wholly owned subsidiary, Indian yes. or foreign company, he can draw from any company. If the holding company shareholders have approved this limit. Amiji, your view or Bala sir, your view. No. Yeah, uh, if the holding company is free to draw salary from either of the companies. I think allow his it. question, I think his question is a little different as I yeah. understand is uh, uh, holding company has uh, approved the payment of remuneration of rupees one CR to one whole time director. Now that person is proposed to be appointed as a whole time director of a subsidiary company also and uh, part of remuneration is proposed to be paid from the subsidiary company. Correct. I understand. Yes. Now, that yes. now, yes. now, if that is the case, so as far as the total remuneration is concerned, the overall remuneration, what he can draw from both of the companies cannot exceed the limit that is in the company where he has the higher limit. Let's say holding company has the higher limit. So holding company limit will be applicable up to that maximum amount he can draw. Mm -hmm. Maybe it can be X amount in holding company and Y amount in the subsidiary company. That is from the uh, remuneration perspective. Now his mm -hmm. question is whether you will require the approval in the subsidiary company also. Obviously the subsidiary company will also pass necessary resolution for the purpose of his appointment. You additionally are also required to see the provisions of section 203. 
where you have to see whether he is qualified to be appointed uh, in the other entity or not because uh, uh, the exception and the carve out uh, are two that kmp of a holding company can become a kmp of a subsidiary now yes. whether this person is a kmp or not that also you have to determine if it is a whole time director whether you will be able to appoint him as a whole time director of a holding company and also a whole time director of a subsidiary that you need yes. to see yeah i agree i think but the question yes. he has put no is a person is appointed by a public limited company for one cr so i assume again you don't have to go to the shareholders your last question was will about proposal require Basically, again approval of the holding company no it is not but yes if it is exceeding the limit assuming your holding company he can draw maximum limit of x number and as rightly said by amit ji subsidiary company he will get x minus something so you will definitely allow him to draw maximum from one of the companies so basically ma'am i am thinking this question from uh, another uh, uh, perspective that is change in terms and condition of the uh, payment of remuneration basically the uh, shareholder had already approved the remuneration of 1 crore payable from the holding so lokesh uh, what yes. generally happens when you yes. go for shareholder approval mm -hmm. up to that maximum limit you mm -hmm. delegate that power to the board of director to do any revision upward or downward or change in the terms and condition right so yes, yes, there sir. is no requirement because if you want uh, don't want to cross the threshold of 1 mm. crore you mm. want to say that part of this remuneration will be paid by the holding company and part will be paid now by the subsidiary company mm. it is well within the powers of the board it will not trigger a fresh approval uh, sir sir but sir another question a schedule 5 a schedule 5 has a, a section a section i think 5 is there that require there any change any uh, approval for for the schedule 5 will require approval of shareholder by a ordinary regulation no but lokesh you have already but... located lokesh you have already approved the shareholders resolution in the holding company parent yes. company up to 1 crore now yes. you can do a secondment of the managing director in your subsidiary company balance amount you can decide shareholders you have not gone specifically that i will give x number from this company y number You, you, I think it's not a change in term. Your term remains one crore only. You are not changing. Yeah, yeah. So From long as the company... term remains one crore, within that, whatever the adjustment you want to do between the holding company and subsidiary company, it is well within the board. The moment okay. that one crore undergoes a change, then only you need the approval from the shareholders. Otherwise, no. So his interpretation is that that if I change. partially from part from one company part from another company whether it will be considered as a change in term or not correct no, it is yes, yes, so long, yes, so long yes. as it is so long as it is within the limit it won't it will be well so within the board it would be it would be considered as a change no doubt about that but point is that whether that change requires the fresh shareholder approval or it is the power that has already been delegated to the board if it is well covered within the delegated power you don't require to reach out to the shareholder again that is my right. view i think you have to just right. i have to locate you have to check your uh, resolution passed earlier whether yes. it gives all the power to the board for any modification yes, it is there it is there ma'am then then i think this is a change but which is within the power of the board to amend so you don't have to go to the shareholders again that's the conclusion i think after we discuss our discussion yes, yes my god it to sum it up i think uh, we all agree amit ji correct yeah. yes yes Uh, Lokesh has one more question. The expression of "office or place of profit" means any place, any office or place where such office or place is held by the director. If the director is holding or receiving from the company anything by way of remuneration over and above the remuneration to which he is entitled as a director by way of salary, so and so, so and so, in a company, holding director is entitled to receive one crore per annum as approved by the member of the company. So any amount exceeding one crore will fall in the office or place of profit. Am I right? No, office or place of profit means if he is now in what term you want to give the excess amount, excess more than one crore. If you are providing him, which is not generally entitled as a, but is a separate service you are providing, he is providing, then it will fall under office or place of profit. You have to see whether that excess amount which you are giving him, that remuneration will be as a part of the remuneration as as a director or as a professional services or otherwise. If it is a part of your director. then you can you you don't fall under the place of profit assuming that you want to give a uh, example like a club membership or anything it's not there now you are just saying one time club membership fee i am i am giving as per my employee manual to my 
director as a director as a director if is getting anything no then you term it as a director is getting it is coming under the remuneration under 196 197 but if you are saying that is a place of profit is entitled to something uh, suppose you are paying the salary or the uh, children's fee then it will he is getting over and above what is not otherwise entitled then it will fall under the officer place of profit i think something more can be elaborated by bala sir or amit sir or dipti I, think I could not, I could not follow the example what uh, Lokesh was trying to give. What is his exact issue? What uh, he mentioned earlier? Yes, he says yes, he says correct. that hmm. amount exceed one crore. But under what what are you going to give to the MD or the WTD that you can express, uh, Lokesh? Uh, basically, my question was that, ma'am, uh, uh, that the person is entitled to receive rupees one crore is approved by the shareholders as okay. WTD of the holding company. Now he is becoming a director of the subsidiary company. Then I think uh, I think uh, the remuneration drawn by uh, drawn by him from their subsidiary company is not required to be approved as a officer place of profit. Yeah, because if he is drawing from the subsidiary company, the subsidiary company also passed the resolution. As a remuneration under one ninety six, so why it will be a place of profit in your parent company? Uh, basically, ma'am, that that subsidiary company is not an Indian company; it is foreign company. It is not required to approve. Then it will, uh, then it will uh, work as per the foreign jurisdiction. Then you don't require; it's not there. There are many foreign entities. So basically, basically, company. he received any any amount uh, with in a, another capacity rather than director. Then it will be fallen under the cap. Uh, yeah. If it uh, would be a. Of, if it would be a indian subsidiary company then he has to draw whatever is a maximum from one of the company but if it is a foreign company where this indian companies act is not applicable the different jurisdiction <coughs> law will be applicable then you don't consider here in this company he is a holding a place of profit that that will be too okay, much of stretching yes ma'am yes ma'am one more question connected uh, there with uh, section 197 14 specified that subject to provision of this section any director Who is in receipt of any commission from the company, and who is a MD or WTD of the company, say not dis, uh, disqualified from receiving any remuneration or commission from any holding subsidiary or subsidiary company of the such company. Uh, my conclusion is there is uh, that he used the who is in receipt of any commission from company, and who is MD WTD not not disqualified from receiving any remuneration commission. Why this uh, word commission is not uh, 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 is also not uh, used with the word remuneration? Basically, though, why uh, the, both words were not used here? Commission or remuneration? The remuneration is a wider term. Remuneration include the fees, salary, commission, everything. So remuneration is a wider think, word. Hmm, commission is not include remuneration. Commission does not. Commission is a part of the remuneration. I think I need to read fourteen. Subject to the provision of this section, any director who is in receipt of any commission from the company and who is a managing or a whole time director of the company shall not be disqualified if he receives any remuneration or commission from the holding company or its subsidiary company of such company, subject to the disclosure in the board report. So that means he can definitely draw mm -hmm. from overseas company. So only thing company has to disclose in your report, board report. That's the only provision. So. Mm -hmm. Even but, the but my confusion that uh, hmm. commission word is written that uh, your question is why commission word is written and not the remuneration word is written. That's your question. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Commission or remuneration so can be it, used. It it's, it's reads that receiving any remuneration or commission. So both. Yes, yes, ma'am. Remuneration is a wider and hmm. or any commission also. So I think this this is a just a, I think your misunderstanding. So basically, what is the general meaning of that that subsection? What is the general meaning of that subsection, ma'am? That means a person can draw any remuneration from the parent or the subsidiary company. Only thing the company has to disclose in the board report. He is not disqualified by drawing remuneration from the other company. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I think Jigna is saying MD should be director first. Then only he can be MD. I think yes, he should be first appointed as a director. In the same resolution, we do not advise to appoint as MD. Second resolution can follow as a managing director. If the company don't file DR at well after the AG, I mean, in regard to the regularization of additional director, what would be the position in the company? See, if you do not get the approval uh, by the shareholders that he is appointed as an additional director, and 
in the annual general meeting shareholders are not appointing reappointing i mean regularizing his appointment then he will step down as a director then definitely he will be not remaining as a director or a managing director both his position he is not a director so obviously he cannot be a md now not filing of dr12 is separate but at least you got the approval dr12 when the version 3 will work you file it so <laughs> And the, I think the question is not for DR12. I think the question is for not approval. Anshuman has put, if a company has one MD, one WDD, three ID, three normal director, one nominated director, what should be the percentage of remuneration? I think we already discussed 197. Okay. Reappointment of MD who is a promoter. Reappointment of MD who is a promoter. Is it a related party transaction for the purpose of approval of the shareholder? Should it exclude promoter shareholding in the voting computation? It is for his appointment. I think he can definitely participate. Uh, Amit ji already clarified. Amit ji, is it correct? He is telling reappointment. So uh, reappointment. Re appointment. It will be. It will be a related party transaction. Uh, but uh, point is that whether uh, you are Voting. crossing the threshold or not. If threshold. So it is just for not... appointment. Appointment remuneration is not mentioned. Just reappointment. If the remuneration is exceeding, then it's different thing. But reappointment of MD, is it a related party transaction? But reappointment will also be entailing the approval of remuneration. So if it is not crossing the threshold of 23.1 of materiality, not uh, requiring any approval. Yeah. So that was, doesn't become, it is a audit related committee party. approval. Audit committee approval will trigger. And the promoter shareholding, also promoter directors can also vote on the transaction where he's interested in the general meeting. General meeting, yes. Yeah, in the general meeting, yeah. In the slides show, it is a same MGT 14 is not required for manager. That is why it is asked. Okay, this is a reference to some slide I don't recollect now. How to determine inadequacy? I think we already discussed. I think you discussed yeah. that. MR3 also to be filed for the reappointment. MR3 to be filed for reappointment. MR1, it is not three. Reappointment, yes. MR1 again for the reappointment. Uh, this is reference to per person, maybe for the schedule five. Per that person. Is on list A, list B, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, list A, list B. In the company, Mr. X is MD for nine months from April to December, and Mr. Y is a whole time director in December to January. December and from January to March, he becomes MD. Which limit of for payment of remuneration will be applicable? 5% or 10%? MD for 9 months from April to December. Why is a whole time director? You have to total, you have to calculate all your director, whole time director in a year if they are crossing. Achha, you are saying 1%, there is no overlapping. It's a part -time, no, part -time. no, no, it is not overlapping. For 9 months, only 5%. Yeah, yeah, because here he is saying there is one director for a period of 9 months. And there are more than one director for the rest of the period of three months. So no, December and no WTD is for four months. December and again from Jan to March. Yeah. So for total four months. So there is an overlapping. So yeah. April to November, it should be uh, five percent. And from December, when Mr. Y was already there, so two persons are there. So from December to March, ten months. Yeah, correct. Absolutely, you're right. I agree with you. No, I don't think Amitji. I have a view that it could be total. You you have more than uh, one MD in a year. So I no, will go, I no, will no, go no, as no. per 10, 5 percent. Limit no. cannot cross more than, I mean, sorry, uh, 10 percent. No, ma'am, should uh, I, tell, yeah, should it be four ATA or it should be four ATA or 10 percent? Because uh, executive I, director was for one month and MD I agree, was for I agree. That's what Dipti and Balaji has a view that it can be pro rata. Amiji, what's your view? My view is not pro rata as. Uh, Maybe liberal so view. as far as 197 remuneration limit are concerned, they are not pro rata. Hmm. As far as uh, schedule 5 limits are concerned, uh, because they have specified uh, it for a year, that has to be pro rata. Correct. That's my view. It cannot be pro rata for percentage for 197, 5% or 10%. But if you go to the schedule 5, clearly what Amit is saying, I am also of the same view. That means for 197, uh, we should calculate as 10%. Yes, yes. Thank so it, you. It's overlapping, no? so it's up to 10%. No, because but, I still think because per person it is 5% more than 1%, it is 10%. So, so long as 1% was there, it should be restricted to 5%. So, during because the year, per person limit is there, so long as 
on one one person, person was a director then it goes automatically 5% only no 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 sir overall yeah. managerial remuneration cap is there for 11% right 5% yeah. or 10% is individual yeah. period is not specified in a year i cannot pay beyond uh, this limit right now whether i want to pay him for part of the month or for uh, part of the period less than one year i don't think should there be any uh, restriction in this regard i think what amit ji uh, bala and uh, bala sir and uh, dipti is saying suppose mr x is appointed in april to december that time i calculated as a 5% and i started giving because there is only one md so i give now after uh, december mr y joined that time there was an overlap mr x was still there till december so in december month i have a two direct two more Absolutely. than one md more than yes. one md so yes in december month what should i calculate the limit i should go to the shareholders immediately considering that now it is an inadequate because it is crossing my 10% because now it is more than two people now so i think that situation is a very hypothetical situation if you are crossing 10 you can't cross for two people immediately 10% so what i understand when mr y is appointed in the month of december you have to calculate both of them in the month of december if they start drawing for the rest of four months up to march are they going to cross together 10% then you have to reach out immediately to the shareholders in the month of december only for the special resolution that's what no, i am only in the month of december there were two persons from january onwards the wtd becomes md so for rest of the three months only one person i will calculate at the year end the limit so no, i should calculate no you can't go day. once again i just interrupt here manoj you can't go to the end of the year and calculate when you are appointing mr y in the december month what is your calculation for both of them assuming mr x and y will continue till march whether you will cross that threshold of the because you don't have to consider the 10% of the this financial year you always consider the for the preceding financial year you should have calculated at the december month when you are appointing mr y no ma'am but for the, uh, of the previous financial years uh, profit no but suppose in 22 23 i don't have a, a sufficient profit i have a inadequacy profit i in have the month in of december if you have a inadequate profit basis your previous financial year then you have to go to the shareholders no, this till regard pre till previous financial year i have sufficient profit but this year i am anticipating it will uh, be inadequacy of profit so i will, i have to go to shareholders no. for wave no so your question is wrong if during this year if there is any inadequacy for the next financial year you have to look at and go to the shareholders for this financial no. suppose you are paying 21 22 this people no, I, suppose... i think what uh, uh, manoj is saying i can understand there is a point because inadequacy has to be tested uh, and the limits uh, what are prescribed in the schedule 5 are to be tested for the year also let us say yeah. for 22 23 uh, yes. we have calculated some amount for payment of remuneration and uh, after 31st march 2023 you do calculation and you find that uh, we have overpaid the money then waiver will be triggered that's yes. correct no i don't agree to that if your your 10% is previous financial year based on the previous financial year and you are uh, making the payment then next financial year onward you may you should go to the shareholders you are not entitled to repay this financial year that's my understanding amit ji i'm not agreeing to your point here maybe See, this can be debated uh, i'll i'll take you to the little background in 1956 law when schedule no, 3 was law, there yes. so there was uh, 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 there was a point where you were required to consider this uh, uh inadequacy only at the time of appointment not in the later year i think that situation still continues so there is a there is a confusion in the professionals whether uh, you have to do this testing of inadequacy and uh, remuneration year on year basis or you are done with just one at the time of appointment So I my view is that it has to be done year on year basis. Otherwise, you will never come to know whether I am uh, paying excess remuneration or not. So no, no, I, I am. I am agreeing. So Amishya, my view I'm... is that year on year basis also you have to see whether you have paid excess money or not. 
I agree year on year we have to see, but that doesn't mean you have to recover excess payment because my calculation of 10% is a preceding financial year. If I am within the limit, then for the next year I have to go back, but for the previous year I can't ask him to repay. I think that's the law is very clear, but it can be debated later. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, ma'am, but when uh, we calculate the uh, commission limit of NED, we have to see the limit of this year profit only. We see this year profit. Suppose in this year, so I that have... Is, that is your uh, terms. You are seeing that this year performance base, base, I have to see this year's profit. But when the, you are yes. paying and calculating, that time you have to do the preceding financial year as per 197 calculation. Payment of commission is always performance link. So what they have performed during the financial year, that I agree. I think we'll park this question here. Unless there is more debate from Mr. Bala and uh, I think Amit ji gave his opinion. I gave my view. Bala sir, what's your and no, no, I, al I also think, see, at the time of the appointment, what you are saying is correct. As per the last audited balance sheet, we calculate and we actually appoint him. But uh, during the year, the situation is actually different because what we presume is, we presume that it is going to be a profit-making company. But unfortunately, the profit-making company turns out to be inadequacy or loss-making company during the year. I think that need to be watched actually because you know if you compute the financial statement, the percentage is as calculated with the reference to the current year profit only it is calculated. So probably at the end of the year, even before the audit is completed, based on the unaudited balance sheet, we need to take up the approval from the shareholder. Only one thing I think we can close. One ninety seven says uh, the percentage for that financial year. Yeah. So we'll leave it that. And I think we have to close at 130. Uh, you have still 12 questions to answer. <laughs> so we have to rush now. We'll park it so, here and we'll go ahead. I, one minute, ma'am. So I, I, I also we, agree with Amit ji and Balaji that one has to be watchful. It cannot be out of your capital, out of the public money or uh, default there you cannot give out of the loss but that is for the future financial year and you have to go as a wise as a wisdom says that you have to reach out but still if you are within the 10 percent of the preceding financial year you the, can't ask this my member i mean the my md to re, recover the money my no, when the amiji the money, said the recover no when amiji said recover the balance there no, i have no, a difference. not recover approval huh. is recovered rest, even in the rest time with amiji that saying that yes it is no, no. You, you have to be you watchful. Are, no, recovery, nine... when I am saying, if it is not waived, then it will be recovered. If it is waived by the shareholder, then it is not recovered. But <laughs> ultimately, recovery. the limits limits are to be checked for that very financial yeah, year. Yeah. It cannot be uh, pegged on the threshold of the previous financial year. Yeah. That is only for the purpose yeah. of giving disclosure in the appointment. That's it. In the shareholder resolution, you are calculating limits based on the previous financial year because you don't have a next year data. But for all other purposes, it has to be on year on year basis for yeah, the year, year, on, which year, you are, year, year on year basis. Definitely. But I think for the recovery and the uh, excess no, amount, whether it is excess or not, will be a question. Then the recovery will no, very come. simple, very simple uh, answer. Uh, Amita, ma'am, let us say previous year, my profits were 100 crore. And based on that, I was in uh, uh, full uh, limit of 197 to pay. Next year, my profit uh, dropped to losses. I don't have any money, right? Now my schedule five get triggered and I have a very limited uh, amount to pay. And let us say I was paying uh, some 10 crore rupees remuneration to my managing director as per previous term. Now I cannot pay if uh, I am paying more than that, then Either I have to take the shareholder approval or I have to take the waiver. Uh, either I have to take the waiver of shareholder or I have to recover. So I think this will take a long time. Amiti will take offline. I have a question. Yeah. I, I do not agree with certain aspect, but let's keep. I think, sorry, Manoj, we'll get back. Uh, maybe Dipti will get back to you with the answer. One we'll second, the... second yeah. Kali, I can take the waiver within two years. It is not yes. required for uh, finalization of accounts. I have to approve, get the approval of the shareholders. I can yeah, always yeah, take absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you can always take the approval of waiver within two years. Absolutely. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. What is the difference between A and B in Schedule 5? Limit A and B? Table A and B, you are talking, I believe. Table A is for the uh, MD and, uh, and all directors, and table and in Schedule B 
is for the professional services. Professional yeah, services. only the professional services. Professional services. Yeah. He is for the remuneration. Can you once again explain inadequacy? I think inadequacy. I think yes. anybody wants to take <laughs> your discuss. I don't think there is now any A and B. Now only one table. One if table. you want to cross beyond that table, you have to pass the special resolution. No, no, Amiji, from the slide, no, there was a, she has put as a A and B. That's the reason. She, she, has, put, she has put A and B. B, she right, discussed right. professional services. Point, yeah. point is that if it is well within the limit, uh, then you can pass ordinary resolution. There is no difference because you have to give all the explanatory statement and the industry wise other details and justification. Only difference is that you cross the threshold prescribed in table, you have to pass a special. I think yeah. that table has no relevance now. Mostly, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Amita, um, yeah. Amita, you have to rush 130, 135 people. So, I think the uh, rest of the question maybe can be taken up later by your firm. Whatever you say, I will. Uh, please, please, I think so. Okay. So last not. question. One last question. Uh -huh. uh, Partha Sen says that if a person acts as a N, uh, nominee plus MD, I think N is what? N, N plus MD in two company of which one has an inadequacy of profit, which special resolution to be taken from both the companies separately for remuneration. I think you can draw from only one company where he's uh, taking a maximum and then the special resolution to be taken from both the company. He will definitely take only from one company you know, where it is maximum mm -hmm. in case of inadequacy of profit. Yeah. And so only one company. Yeah, I think uh, somebody is talking. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, yeah, you carry on my team. Will okay. Can we can we appoint CEO for today meeting with effect from 1st February? Any retrospective would be... We already discussed, yeah. yeah already yeah. discussed. Is there any restriction in payment of remuneration to director for his services of professional nature if he's a promoter holding directly, indirectly, 100% shareholding? No, for a listed company, yes, there will be a definitely a restriction. But for a private unlisted company, you can pay separately professional fees also, though he's holding 100% shareholding. Yeah. No bar. GST, we don't want to take for listed yeah. companies. Appointment no, of he, he is not talking GST. He is talking GST applicable, TDS applicable. British Bogan says TDS applicable. Uh, reverse I'm charge sitting, and all we don't want to take. Yeah, yeah, leave it, leave it there. For listed companies, appointment of designated MD or chairman compulsorily along with the whole time director. No, there is no need. If you have a whole time director, you can always have a uh, CEO also. There is no need that you should have an MD. That was the question, I believe. Appointment of designated MD or chairman compulsorily if you have a whole time director. MD is compulsory or not. Uh, Amici, am I right now saying that there can be a WTD and a chairman? No, sorry. Uh, I could not follow, ma'am. Please. Uh, the question is for a listed company is appointment of a MD or chairman is compulsorily along with WTD. They have a WTD, but they should appoint an MD. I think that instead of MD, there can be a CEO also. But yes, either MD or CEO you should have along with your WTD. Yes, yes. Because yes, WTD is not having a complete power, whereas MD or CEO yes, yes, has overall. So it absolutely. can be either MD or a CEO along with the WTD. But just WTD doesn't work. Absolutely. Uh, TDS will be deducted on sitting fees, GST. I uh, don't want to take uh, GST. Uh, Vipin says in case appointment of an individual as MD into company, will he be executive director in both the company and will he draw remuneration from both the company? Again, maximum from one company he can draw. Yeah. This will discuss question. pro rata and all I that. These are all same. Uh, one more question, just one. Nimisha Goel says, I have one doubt, please consider. If a person is an MD into public company, then what would be the higher limit of remuneration that he could be paid to him? That is admissible limit, maximum remuneration that could be paid as per the special resolution passed by the company or the actual amount of remuneration paid to him in that company for calculating the higher amount, higher limit that could be payable to him from both the company. I think any one company he can take from the maximum, whichever is paying highest. He can't, he can't take from both the company. Yeah, and next two questions you can take and then you have answered everything. Is an executive director deemed to be a whole time director in a public company, public unlisted company while cal calculating M managerial remuneration? Executive director deemed to be a whole time director? Not necessarily. 
all WTD become executive director, but executive director cannot be a whole time director unless he's an employee of the company. He's just executive role. He may not be a whole time employee of the company. WTD must be a whole time employee. And last question: Can CS for a comp of a company be a CEF CFO for an associate company? I think yes. There is no bar. Only thing you have to see is like section two zero three, as Amit ji has pointed out. Yes, I think your answer. The last question Atul Kedia says waiver approval has to be taken from the shareholders. I think it is a statement, not the ah, statement. Answer. That's right. Your so, answer. So I think yes, waiver approval. So well done, Amit. Within timeline. <laughs> With a past, uh, we have exceeded some timeline, and I think this one question will remain, which I will debate with Amitji separately. Amitji, be prepared. Let's have a call whenever yeah. your time permits, and we'll get back to Manoj and uh, Meta and Meta on that. Okay, thanks, Amita. Thanks a uh, lot, Amit. Also, at last you joined, uh, but uh, doing fast course. So thanks for that. Uh, as usual, Mr. Bala. Amitji, I thank you really appreciate whenever you join. No, I always take an opportunity to get your views. He is into research and he is academically so sound. I always get inspired by him. So pleasure to connect uh, soon, Amitji. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Bala. Thanks uh, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank thanks. You. And we will meet next Saturday. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. I must, I I must say actually. The session was really, really, you know, very useful. And the time itself shows that we are at almost 135, although we scheduled to be at one o'clock or something like that. That shows the interest of the people, that shows the importance of the topic. I think we keep on discussing on it. More to discuss will be there. Even at this point at I can say 80 people are there. This is a great <laughs> thanks a lot. I thanks thought, a, I thought thanks this a lot, topic Amita, is for very... your valuable inputs. Thanks a lot. It's a I, one, one second. One yeah. second, I'll take. I thought this question answer must be so easy and simple, but I think question answer was very interesting than the presentation. Presentation get the set the tone for the meeting, but I think we picked yeah. up later after the presentation. No, no, so we should out thought, actually, 15 minutes more. My apology course. for that. Yeah. No, no, we always stretch up to 1.30. So yeah. I then was hammering you. Okay. Thanks, Malia, for presentation. And yes, Amita, as rightly said, we always give presentation to set the tone and then it becomes too interactive and it takes it to end. Thanks, Thank you, Thanks, Thanks you. everyone for your participation. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Malisha. You are nicely presented. Very mm -hmm. lucid language and your flow was also good. Thanks to you also. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.